evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Finance and Administrative Committee to order on February 2nd, 2023. Ms. Coakley, will you please call the roll? Mr. Green? Here. Mrs. Hansen? Here. Mrs. Rutherford? Here. Mrs. Fauntleroy? Here. Mr. Harrell? Here. Mrs. Martin? Here. Mrs. Moore? Here. Dr. Peterson? Here. Mrs. Baker? Here. Mrs. McCollum? Here. Mrs. Lamey? Here. Mrs. Hurstis? Present. Mr. Bro? Here. Mr. Kuzan? And Mrs. Rufino Gallagher. Thank you. I've asked Dr. Peterson to lead us in the invocation and pledge this evening. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, you would bless our proceedings today with your wisdom and your guidance, and that uh, you will always lead us to do what is best for our community, our families, and especially for our children. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Would any board members like to recognize visitors this evening? I'll wait. Ms. Rutherford. I'd like to recognize my husband, Gary. Um, Ms. Burkett from Lyon Elementary. Ms. Mallory from, I mean, Ms. Mallory and Ms. Astigue and Ms. Um, Galeas from Lake Harbor and Ms. Mitchell from um, Mandeville Middle. Thank, thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you all for being here. Anyone else? Um, I'd like to acknowledge someone that we don't know. He is, he ran the 10 year old basketball team at um, Pelican Park, and his group came in number one, Mr. Steve Alfonso. He won it on draft night. <laughs> uh, next up, uh, Mr. Jabia will have our superintendent's update. Thank you all so much. Uh, yeah, Mr. Alfonso is a uh, King of the Youth Basketball League. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All talent, Steve. Um, but thank you all. I, board members, rather than running back and forth to my seat, I'm just going to kind of do everything from here, uh, make it a little bit easier and try to expedite it a little bit. Um, first thing I want to talk to you about is uh, Safe Path to School. So I'm on the Safe Path to School uh, task force that was started by Dr. Pisa in Slidell and the Savoy family. Uh, if you remember, one of our uh, private schools in Slidell, um, we lost a student, uh, Miss Emma Savoy, uh, in a tragic accident after school at dismissal. So they started the task force to bring awareness and try to educate people, uh, especially parents and children, about drop off, pick up, you know, getting to school, getting home, getting everyone to slow down. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about that, but I want you to see a video. I partnered with Channel 13 uh, and the task force to kind of put something out to our parents so that we can kind of educate them about dropping off and picking up. And if you please join me with that video, that'd be great. Hey, it's me. Thanks for helping out picking up the kids. Just a couple more days and I'll be done with this project at work. I left you a book. I hope it helps. Bye. Student safety is first in St. Tammany. These guidelines are provided to help ensure the safety of our students, and we ask for your cooperation in following these procedures for Carline safety. Over the last few years, the population in this area has drastically changed. Uh, there's a lot more people here, there's a lot more people in the car lines, the drop-off lines for the schools in the area. The whole point of the car line and the protocol set by the schools and the protocol set by the state is to make sure that everybody's safe. We've been taught since preschool how to form a line. It's not complicated. Unfortunately, there are people that are just in a hurry, running really late, and just dropping their kids off really fast. But the truth is, we're all just dropping our kids off super fast, running late or late for a meeting. And that's why we're in the car line too. There's a lot of traffic during pickup and drop off times around school zones. 
Going slower gives you more time to react and may save a life. So while you're sitting in car line, you should be aware of your surroundings at all times. Be watching for children walking across the street. Be watching for school administrators to give you the next signal on what to do next and obey all signs that you see. Every school has their own rules for the road. So remember, pay attention to the signs that are out there and follow directions. We have walkers. We have students who, unfortunately, sometimes they are not as alert. So we got to be alert for them. When you're in those car lines, this isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. There's a lot of people wanting to drop their children off. You're not the only one. So pay attention. I know when you're in the car, you feel like you want to send the text, send the email, or do a little work, but just stop and relax and just wait and pay attention. We have state laws in place that protect our children, protect all the citizens within the school zone. It's called a hands-free zone. We are creatures of habit, and we have to understand that hands-free zone or not, just cell phones, period, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be on your cell phones while driving. Even if you do everything right, there's still a chance that another parent may be having an off day. If that's the case, take a deep breath and show some patience. Wherever you have to go, it'll be there in 10 minutes. Just be patient, get through the process, and help us keep our children safe. Doesn't matter how much of a hurry you're in, what kind of car you're driving, none of that stuff matters. Be patient, wait your turn, stay in line. Give your full undivided attention for 15, 20 minutes on getting your child safe to school. In short, a little politeness goes a long way in the car line and beyond. Now put the book down. The car in front of you just moved up. So thank you to Channel 13 for helping us do that and put that together. So what we're going to do is we're going to partner with the task force. And on February the 15th, we're going to ask all of our students to wear yellow in remembrance of Emma and ask all of our schools to, to go through the, the safety protocols for pickup, drop off, for moving around so that we can do all those. And we're going to put those things out on social media and get parents to watch this video again you know, we're all in a hurry, just like it said, and it's just so important for everybody to just kind of slow down, take a deep breath, and go from there. So we look forward to doing that on the 15th, and I'll be putting that out in my email tomorrow to the faculty and staff. Uh, next, I want to bring your attention to Winter Olympics. Our SWE Olympics happened last week, and it was just a great opportunity to see what our, our, our SWE students can do and let them practice their skills and show off their skills uh, with their friends and their classmates and uh, please check out a quick video on our Winter Olympics. These are our uh, Winter Olympic Games for our elementary students who participate in adaptive physical education. Each of these games, which are exceptionally fun, as you can tell from what's going on behind me, that the kids work on through their adaptive physical education program. I am really excited. It is really fun. I love helping out with things because it just makes me feel really good to really to just help and to volunteer for things because there are some people who just really need the help. And just to see these kids, the smiles they have on their faces and just the enjoyment of being with their friends, with their classmates and just competing and having a great time just playing games just you know I wish I wish we were able to do this year round and have these kind of events because the smiles in their faces are just unbelievable it was fun to see how happy they were to play these games sweet department is doing a tremendous job what started as a as a kind of a work around COVID, kind of getting these things done, to what we're doing right now, to being able to capture the smiles that we get right now and all the events. They do a tremendous job every day. It was, like I said, it was just so great to see these kids. I mean, they just smiling from ear to ear. And I just want to thank all of our adaptive PE department, our teachers, our paras, 
our OT, our PTs, everybody that made this possible because it took volunteers. We did multiple schools every day at the same time. And so to get those things done and to do it so safely and so productive is just wonderful. So thank you to our entire SWE department and all of our teachers and faculty and staff. Next, I'd like to, to share with you future focus. Uh, we've been talking about that for a while. It's been off to a great start. We're about halfway finished our tour and uh, the feedback has just been tremendous. So I'm gonna let you check out our future focus video and kind of roll to the next thing. One second. Future Focus um, has the purpose of informing seventh grade students and their parents about the opportunities in high school regarding academic and career tech. We start off in the gymnasium with a presentation for students and parents, just informing them of what's available and the opportunities in the high schools. And then the students move into the cafeterias where their feet are high school and their teachers and students and organizations are there. Just trying to inform parents, trying to help them make an early decision. There's so many options for our high school kids, junior high kids getting to that point. So we're trying to get our seventh graders to make sure they understand what's going on, what kind of options, what kind of opportunities out there. Because right now there's so many. I think it's a great outreach for all of the students at Boya Junior High to find where they think they can have a successful career, not only just for themselves, but to see who might also from their school be in that same career. So it's nice just to see what is out there for the parents because um, we don't get a lot of uh, we get a lot of information from the kids all the time. So it's nice to hear it and to be able to come and see and, and talk to them ourselves too. The decisions that they're going to make in the next year will impact the choices that they'll be making as they enter high school and beyond. So as that parent said, that's why it's so important for the parents to be there with them, just so they can see for themselves and see all the opportunity and options that they have. And that kind of segues into uh, what I really want to talk about when it comes to future focus. I want to remind everybody that our parish uh, has a career and college expo that will be held next Wednesday, February the 8th, at the Harbor Center from 5 to 8. Uh, and it will be for all 8th grade students and above. Uh, so they get to experience with their families uh, everything that we have to offer in this area. So we have over 100 universities, colleges, technical programs, military branches, and business industry that will be there to show off what we have to offer our kids, what the future looks like, what preparation looks like, and we'll be there to answer all those questions. So I look forward to having that. And with that being said, we, what we did was we opened up to our junior high and high school uh, broadcasting students the ability to create a PSA. Uh, to be able to, uh, a public service announcement advertising our expo. Uh, so they did that, and I'm proud to announce that North Shore High School was the winner of that expo, uh, edited by Christy C.J. Chambers and featuring uh, student Skylar Walsh and produced under the direction of Ms. Annie Verswivelt and Ms. Christine Scheller. Uh, all the videos that were sent in are going to be used on social media, on our website, advertising the expo. Uh, but I wanted you to check out what North Shore High School students produced uh, for the expo. Hey there. You must be headed to the Career and College Expo. Looking like that, that doesn't look very future ready. Well, that's all right, bud. Try this. Much better. Do you know what college you want to go to? What about potential career? Hey, now that's okay. That's exactly what the Career Expo is for. There will be plenty of community colleges, universities, and technical colleges, apprenticeships, business leaders, and even military recruiters there to help you be future ready. Now, all that's left is to get there. You do know where you're going, don't you? <sighs> Fine. Have a graphic overlay then. The 2023 St. Tammany Parish School Career and College Expo will be held on February 8th at the Harbor Center on 100 Harbor Center Boulevard in Slidell from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Now, you are future ready. So just 
our, our kids are amazing. They, they do such creative things, and, and that's just typical of a high school student right there. <laughs> After raising two, that, that's exactly what they look like. So, um, but just, we're, we're just so excited uh, just talking with Ms. Stradiberger and Miss Alexis, just the amount of participation, the amount of community involvement, of everyone that wants to be part of this expo and everything that we have to offer. So I just, I just can't say any more about how happy I am and how excited I am, and I'm looking forward to uh, board members joining me on, on Wednesday and uh, being part of such a great event. I just want to thank everybody for helping put that together. So that's it, Mr. Green. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jabby. I'll ask you to stay up there to uh, present our student art board, uh, art work recognition. Yes, sir. So it, it is my honor tonight to recognize a student that created the 2122 Annual Comprehensive Financial Handbook. Uh, and that artwork was uh, submitted by Lyon Elementary student Dunya Dominguez Gutierrez, a third grader at Lyon Elementary. If Ms. Rutherford would join me up here. Just... Uh, if you would just take a look at it, it's just amazing what we, what our students are able to do, what they're able to create, and, and just the, the work that we're doing. It's just amazing. So congratulations, Thank girl. I'm so you. proud of you. Let's take a picture over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I want to recognize Ms. Robin Henderson, her teacher, Principal Rebecca Burkett. Uh, if y'all would come up for me and take a picture also, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank y'all so much. And will, will her family, friends, and everybody from Lyon is here, would y'all please stand up and be recognized, please? Like I said, it's just amazing the creativity and, and just the, the sheer talent that our students have. It's just absolutely amazing. So I just want to thank Dunya and everyone uh, from Lyon uh, for helping us with that. And congratulations to Terry and her team for, uh, for having a tremendous piece of artwork on top there. So thank you all very much, board members. Thank you, Mr. Jabby. And congratulations, Dunya. That was beautiful artwork. Um, you are very talented. Keep it up, okay? Um, next on our agenda, I'd like to invite Mr. Brian Huval up uh, for some certificate of achievements for our financial reporting team. So, Mr. Huval. Great, good evening. <clears throat> uh, my name is Brian Huval. I'm an, uh, an audit director for Laporte CPAs and Business Advisors. And tonight, I am uh, here to present two awards. Um, uh, these awards demonstrate that the school board is committed to fiscal transparency as you share financial information above and beyond what's required by generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, uh, and also demonstrating a high level of sophistication and expertise in your financial reporting. Both of these awards, uh, the reports are submitted to the respective organizations and are scrutinized against a rigorous checklist by selected review, uh, report reviewers with expertise in public sector financial reporting. What is really impressive is that the St. Tammany Parish School Board has won these two awards for 34 consecutive years. That's impressive, that's great. Um, the first award is from the Government Finance Officers Association, or GFOA. Uh, this association is known as the premier governmental accounting organization so their standards are very high, uh, and your school district is consistently meeting these high standards, which is a tribute to your team. The second award is from the Association of School Business Officials, or ASBO for short. This award focuses on much the same criteria as the GFOA award, but it's specific to school districts only, so the review is a little more specific. 
So uh, notably now only 20 school districts in Louisiana received this award last year. So that's less than one third of all school districts. So you're in good company. So uh, for these reasons, it is my honor to congratulate the board, the administration, and especially the finance department on this achievement. So um, with that, at this time, I'd like Gary Silva to come up and accept uh, these awards on behalf of the St. Tammany Parish School Board. Great job, sir. Great job, appreciate it. So um, now, am I still going to be up next for the... If, if those both of the wards, I think that's it. But I okay. did want to ask Mr. Jabby to come up because I know we wanted to recognize a, a handful of members from the from the finance team. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Fall. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Appreciate you doing that. Thank you so much. Just uh, we have we have some members of our finance staff here, and I want to recognize them. Uh, they they mostly work behind the scenes, and they they service this board anytime needed. Uh, but as Mr. Huval said. Um, We've won this award 34 consecutive years. So without an amazing finance department, that would not be possible. Um, so if you would stand when I, when I call your name, please. Our supervisor of purchasing, Ms. Tiffany Carrasco. Our supervisor of payroll, Ms. Tammy Ryan. Our supervisor of payroll, Mr. Ron Randolph. And our chief accountant, Mr. Gary Silva. Thank you all so much for all you do. And I would, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the entire finance department staff. I mean, we are truly blessed. Uh, they do a tremendous job. It's amazing. The accounts receivable, the purchasing that takes place in this parish, and to pay 6,000, basically 6,000 employees on time and so accurate every pay period, no matter what the issue is, no matter what the timesheet, no matter what they've worked to accomplish, that all gets done seamlessly. Absolutely seamlessly. So thank you, Terry, for all you do, and thank you, people. They do a tremendous job. Thank you. Thank you, Terry and team. And Mr. Jeb, I'll ask you back up. <laughs> I'm telling you. I know y'all are tired of hearing my voice. I, I promise I'm going to be for quiet and sit down and shut up for a little while. Um, but tonight it is my pleasure to uh, recognize Channel 13, um, Channel 13 has been awarded uh, Suncoast Emmy Award for the first time in school system history. Um, it is an absolute honor. It, it's, it's what you dream about if you're in the TV business. It's what you dream about if you see it. I mean, you, you can watch the Emmys anytime you want during the year, and, and, and that is exactly the kind of ceremony uh, that Channel 13 participated in. Just to give you a little bit of a backstory, um, I, Mr. Dan Snyder, who you may recognize Mr. Dan made, was made popular um, for his work with Netflix in the documentary, The Pharmacist, that uh, told the story about his son and the loss of his son uh, to, to drugs and, and, and him being killed, um, parts and narcotics. But he was, on a, he was on a quest to find the true person that did that and also shut down the pill mills that have plagued Metro New Orleans area. And that was his passion, that's what he did. Uh, and he accomplished those goals. Uh, he did a tremendous job. I had the, the pleasure of meeting Dr. Dan, came over and he contacted me as a superintendent, contacted Randy Smith, the sheriff, and contacted Chuck Preston as a coroner and said, hey, you know, I, we, we need to start targeting fentanyl, we need to start targeting these designer drugs that are plaguing our children and our community. What can we do? We need to get together. We need to do some PSAs. We need to get in front of kids. What can we do? So uh, Dr. Melody Swain, Kevin Mumphrey, and Rhett Sharp uh, met with me, met with uh, Dr. Dan, and put together uh, about a nine-minute documentary that kind of told Dr. Dan's story, also went into where we are right now, what's plaguing our society, fentanyl, and all the drugs that, that, are, that are in our communities right now, and how can we address those? So we, we, we did that as a part of Red Ribbon Week. I always say Red Ribbon Week when I was a principal. <laughs> For some reason, I always get tongue-tied doing that. But we partnered with our Red Ribbon Experience, and, and we, we put this out to our students, 
and made them aware and try to educate them as much as possible because they're being targeted so much on social, me social media and apps they use by people they've never met in their life. And they're buying things and purchasing things without their parents' knowledge. And Dr. Dan did a great job of helping us bring that to light. Um, so with that being said, uh, Dr. Swing and uh, Kevin Mumphrey and Rhett Sharp were able to produce an amazing video that I sent to you. And right now, before I call them up, I want you guys to see uh, them receive the awards at the Suncoast Emmys and how that presentation was developed. And for category 62, so it's societal concerns, short and long form, we have two recipients. And the first of those Emmys goes to Dan Schneider, the pharmacist. I attempted to buy drugs. I had no knowledge of his addiction, okay, but obviously he had an addiction. I, I came to learn a lot about addiction after that, but I also had to go on a mission. I had to go in and try to find his killer. I want to thank the Suncoast Emmys. Um, we want to thank the rest of our crew back at home, especially our school board and our school superintendent, our spouses that are here for their love and support, and especially to Dan Snyder, the pharmacist, who had the courage to tell this heartbreaking story of his son who was killed in a drug deal in order to help save the lives of others. So we dedicate this to him. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the Suncoast Emmys and the judges for seeing the effort that Rhett and I and all of us put into in this, uh, this piece. Thank you. Quickly, I want to thank my, my family, my beautiful wife, and my kids, uh, Sloan and Reese. I love you. Go to sleep now. So. So if Dr. Menard and uh, Rhett Sharp and Kevin Mumford, y'all join me down here. So as you can imagine, this is what you see. This is what we've all seen for so many years on TV. So I just want to present them their Emmy Awards and, and tell you all so much congratulations. Meredith, can we get a picture of you, mind? So I um, want to thank you all. You know, we... Um, it was such an honor to be able to think that we're going to bring this Emmy back for the school board. And that's really what um, made this so special. So I want to thank you all for your support over the years. Um, and if Dan Snyder would uh, join me for a moment. So Dan, on behalf of Kevin and Red and myself, um, we want to thank you for sharing your story. You know, we can be as good as we can be, but without the story, you don't have an award-winning video. So we want to thank you because I know that you had the courage to tell your story. And you know, every time you tell your story, there's a bit of heartbreak, but there's also a lot of hope that you can save the lives of others. So on behalf of the three of us, we present you with the Suncoast Chapter um, Emmy plaque of recognizing Dan Snyder as a contributor to the to the video. Well, so for you. Well, I, I got to give some thanks to uh, to the school board for sponsoring the pharmacist video in our schools, showed it in our schools and hopefully repeating it at least yearly and I understand that they actually doing that. I also want to thank Melody and Rhett and Kevin uh, for telling the story in such a well-produced documentary. 
I, we, we all need to congratulate them on a well-deserved Emmy. Amen. I want to I want to say that we we losing right now 108,000 Americans died last year, more than enough to fill LSU's Death Valley Stadium. Summer students that tried prescription pills that turned out to be counterfeit and contained the potent opioid fentanyl. By deceit, they were poisoned. In this video, we shared the phrase, one pill can kill. This message must be shared by us all as a warning of today's deadlier danger of illicit drug use. I, we have to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and continue to show it. Fortunately, I don't believe we in our public school system have lost some a kid to one pill can kill, but it's been happening all around the country and it's a, a, a big tragedy. I do want to say too, though, that I have another focus now that I at least want to bring y'all's attention to. And, and this is more for people who have active addictions. Some of these kids might take a poisonous pill and thank God survive, but it's very addictive. And then also we have the other people that are more adult based and they're not experimenting anymore. They develop addictions. Okay. For those with active addictions, we must encourage and support treatment for all. There are medicines to help in the treatment of addiction. This is called medically assisted treatment or MAT. If you see MAT, that's what it stands for. Okay. Please become aware and help the pharmacists promote MAT. It is currently the only way and the least costly way to provide treatment to all and significantly reduce overdose deaths. For any information on this, and some of y'all have this sheet, I believe, and I think some of it's been passed and there's some up on the counter, okay? If you want more information on this, if you have any doubts about it, because there's a little bit of a stigma associated with MAT, okay? Uh, but it's really the only way that we can treat the overwhelming number of people that have addiction. Uh, not everybody's going to succeed. It's not a perfect situation, but if we get more on it, we can save a lot of lives. So if information is, you can go to my uh, email. Send me a, a question on my email, and I have that list at dschneider at tfhope.com or my website, which is tunnelofhope.org. And again, I'd like to thank all of y'all, all of y'all's efforts, and let's spread the word. Yes, Amen. Again, thank you to Melanie Rett and Kevin and Dr. Dan, and please tell your wife, Andy, we said hello, and uh, I just appreciate everything that Dan's done for the students of St. Tammy Parish, so thank you all very much. Thank you, team, um, <clears throat> and Dr. Schneider. I will open it up for any comments from the board, if anybody had any. If not, oh, Ms. Gallagher. I would just like to say to Dr. Schneider, I appreciate you opening your story and telling the story. The same happened for a member of my family, and we didn't have the courage to do that. So I appreciate what you've done and all the work you have done to try to get these, to let the community know that people are out there, they need help, that they're good people. So thank you. Um, at this time, I would like any visitors uh, or any folks that received awards that uh, want to leave before our long, lengthy business agenda, um, feel free to do so. We'll take a very quick uh, two-minute recess for you all to, uh, to go. Oh.
I'd like to call our meeting back to order and move on with our agenda. Our next item is the approval of minutes from the committee as a whole meeting held on December 1st, 2022. Do I have a motion? Mr. Bro, do I have a second? Ms. Moore, any questions from the public? Seeing none, questions from the board? Seeing none, let's please vote. That motion carries 11 yeas, three abstentions. Our next item is, is the presentation of the fiscal year 21-22 annual comprehensive financial report and audit. And I would like to welcome Mr. Huval back up to the podium. I thought they were going to go back to back earlier, so that's why I was hesitant about getting out of here. But it, uh, You can still leave earlier. after you're done, though. You uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the award that I gave earlier, I mean, this is it. 176 pages of what Gary and his team go through and, and fix every year and that we've audited. And so what I want to do is just kind of highlight a few things out of here uh, next. So do I have to uh, do I have control of this thing? Just press a button. Mm -hmm. hey, there you go. In this in this report, there's we issue several reports uh, in, in this audited financial statement. Uh, the first report uh, is the independent auditors report that we dated December 16th, 2022. Now in that report, that's the main report of the whole financial statements, we issued an unmodified opinion or a clean opinion on the basic financial statements. What that means is that it's basically states your financial statements are fairly presented in accordance with government auditing standards. Okay, so that's a clean, clean report, a clean opinion. The next report that we issue is the Government Audit Standards Report, or the Yellow Book Report. Uh, in that report, it covers two areas, the internal controls over financial reporting and the compliance with laws and regulations. And in that report, we concluded that there were no material or significant deficiencies that we identified over your internal controls over financial reporting. And also that there were no non-compliance with laws and regulations that were identified as a result of our testing. So this is a clear, clean report with no findings. The next report, its third report, is a uniform guidance report. This is the single audit report. This is over federal, your federal grants, your federal monies. Uh, and in that report, we noted that, again, there were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies that we identified over your internal controls, over, com uh, over the compliance related to your federal awards. It's, it's a separate set of controls that you have there. Uh, so we had no findings or material weaknesses there. We issued then an unmodified opinion or a clean opinion on the compliance requirements for the major programs, and that we also issued an unmodified opinion or clean opinion on the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. So again, a clean report. Sorry about that. Y'all stop me next time. All right. Next is the uh, required communications uh, to those charged with governance, which, which is this board here. Uh, the first section deals with the qualitative aspects of accounting practices that y'all follow. Uh, last year, there was one new accounting standard that was adopted. It dealt with GASB 87, which dealt with leases. Uh, the application of all the other existing policies were unchanged during the year. They remain the same as previous year. And uh, the, sensitive the sensitive estimates that we identified in our audit uh, were the useful lives of capital assets for the depreciation of them, uh, net pension liability, your net OPEB liability, which is your other post-employment benefits, and then claims liability, which is your insurance. Um, there were uh, no difficulties encountered in performing the audit. We had no corrected or uncorrected misstatements that we found in performing our audit. We had no disagreements with the management in doing our audit. Uh, there were no cons consultations with other accountants that we know of, and there were no other findings or issues to report to this board, so it was a clean report to report to y'all, okay? Next, this is a, um, we're required to do some agreed upon procedures. It's an engagement that we do. Uh, that's required by Bessie and the Louisiana Legislative Auditor. 
Um, in, that, in, in that engagement, we perform specific procedures on the general fund instructional and support expenditures and certain local revenue sources. We also perform procedures on class size characteristics, the education levels and experience of public school staff, and the average salaries of public school staff. Uh, and in that report, we concluded that there, there were no exceptions that we found in performing these procedures. So there was nothing to report. It's a, another clean report. So, God bless you. Uh, and, and finally, the future of accounting, the future changes. There is a, an important upcoming accounting change for this fiscal year that we're in right now. It's GASB statement number 96. It deals with subscription-based information technology arrangements. And that GAS, this GASB is going to outline how these arrangements are to be accounted for and reported in your financial statements for 2023. So that's something that has to be implemented this year. So with that, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Huval. I um, will open up the floor to the board for any questions that they may have for you um, or maybe for Ms. Prevost. But first is Ms. Baker. Thank you so much for this report. Mm -hmm. uh, my question just, I guess, is for Ms. Prevost. Is this, is this report, should any public um, taxpayer want to review it? it where, where could they go to review it themselves? It's on our website under the finance section where we have financial statements and all the checkbook and all the information. And also, it'll. I'm not sure if it's posted on Louisiana Legislative Auditor yet. Um, they're a little, usually a little slow, but it might be up. I haven't checked, but it'll be there eventually. Okay. Well, all our reports are there by year. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. thank you and congratulations yes. to you, you and your Great department job. for such a clean audit. Thank you. Mr. Bro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just just uh, for my information, on the second to last slide, you put in parentheses, no schedule. What does that mean? There was not a schedule related to that procedure. The first one, there's a schedule of actual expenditures and revenues. The second one is actually a schedule of the, of the class size and the numbers and everything. But the, the last two, there's no schedule that's okay. associated with it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Yuval, your, your team at LaPorte focuses specifically on government auditing of government agencies. Your team or specifically yes, we schools? Do. Yes, we do. And just out of curiosity, how often do you run across a situation where you've got unmodified, perfectly clean, no discrep, you know. All the way through? All the way through? Uh, probably about 40% of the time. Okay. And the reason why you'll have that is, is as probably y'all know, Terry is very big in making sure y'all have the controls in place to help catch anything going wrong out there. And, and she stays on top of it constantly. So, and it's reflected in these financial statements and in, in, in the audit. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you all for having me. Appreciate Thank it. You, sir. Thanks. Uh, the next items on our agenda is uh, item B, uh, recommends acceptance of revisions to school board policy BCBD, agenda preparation and dissemination. Do I have a motion? Mr. Bro, do I have a second? Ms. Lamey? Uh, I'd like to open that up for public comment. Yes, sir. Mr. Osborne. Thank you. Uh, good evening, board members. Uh, I'm excited to see these two particular policies on here uh, because I've just sensed, and I think a number of you sensed along the campaign trail, that, that the public wants um, more access and, you know, a freer exchange of ideas all balanced, of course, by the fact that we have to, you, you guys have to run business. So it's sort of a, a balance. So I, so I think um, it's always good to review policies and look at things like that. Um, you, you may find it is better to do it in a work group. Uh, I think Mr. Green said one night it's like making sausage. So you may find tonight that it's frustrating to, to put it all into a policy in, a, in an open meeting. But um, with that being said, um, I like what I see. Um, some things to maybe consider maybe have some agenda items that don't normally require in a vote, like the, the, the routine reports, whether it's transportation or things like that, if they could just always universally have the ability for the public to comment. 
it maybe can get some of those comments out earlier so that the end of the meeting uh, doesn't, doesn't have to be so long and um, it could be done at a more relevant time. Um, if, if I could also request Friday at by noon sometimes is a really tight window because some of these meetings run long. I mean, my prediction tonight may be four hours, but hopefully I'm wrong. Um, so the next day, if that request has to be made um, by noon on Friday, it can be tough to kind of get some of these things done. So just maybe a recommendation Monday instead of Friday, that way a citizen could reach out to their board member because if they have to get two folks before noon on a work day, that may be hard to pull off. Um, just an idea. Um, also with anybody that's not included in that list at the top, committee chairperson, school board member, superintendent, administrative staff, or employee of the school district, um, if you're not in there, so that would include taxpayers, and it would also include groups like the Federation. So that's going to be covered in the third paragraph. Um, they request to the superintendent, maybe open that up also to the board president, and maybe include some criteria, because I'll tell you, I've never, I've never been successful getting on, getting on the agenda. So um, there is a, a study I'd like to share with you guys that uh, employees, I think it was about 300 employees, some good data that I would like to be able to just present in brief to set up a, a further review by the board at your leisure, um, just for, for instance. Um, but I think the tweaks here are good, and, I, and, I, and that's what I want. I want goodwill. I want nobody to come down here and feel angry because they felt blocked or whatever it is. And we may not always like the point of view, but it's healthy to get it out there because if somebody goes home and they didn't get a chance to address you, I think it turns out worse for everybody, and I don't want to see that. So, but those are just some thoughts. I appreciate y'all uh, bringing this up. Thank you. Evening, board members and uh, Superintendent Jabia. Uh, page one, paragraph six of the current school board policy paper on public participation in school board meetings. There's a list of pro prohibitions that include no defamatory comments accusatory comments or comments relative to performance of specific employees or potential employees shall be permitted. Uh, these are all prohibitions that are violations of the First Amendment. To clarify, to declare that someone's statements as defamatory requires that an oppositional opinion. Sir, you, you're not speaking to the motion at hand unless I'm missing something here. We're talking about adding agenda items to an agenda. I don't think we're talking about public comment. Well, that's part of your. You want to okay. wait for the next one? <laughs> My bad. That's okay. Okay. I will wait. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Broom? Good evening. Uh, my name is Robert Broom from Slidell. I'd like to make a brief comment about um, the agenda item and just to um, reiterate the or support the other, earlier speaker, um, the ability for members of the public to ask questions and make comments or at least make comments on items that are not going to be a, a, up for a vote. For instance, the, uh, the uh, audit that we just heard about. I would encourage the board to do whatever they can to support that idea. Um, there's often a time when um, I would like to say something, or I'm sure members of the uh, audience would like to make a comment about some of these reports. Um, and having that opportunity would, I think, be beneficial for the board and for the public. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from the public? I'll now open it up to the board. No one in the queue? Ms. Baker. Okay, just to be clear, so if a constituent comes, I'm reading this blue part right here. So if a constituent comes to us once an agenda item, if two or more people on the board agree that that should be an agenda item, 
and it goes on the agenda, regardless of it's, if it's a votable item or not, we will ask for public comment, correct? No. You're saying no. Help me. Only if you additionally ask for it to be a public comment. So, it's not automatically public comment unless you, the board members request it to be a public comment. That's the way I read it. In that moment or as it will be on the agenda? It so, has to be on the agenda. That we're asking for public comment. Yeah, exactly. Okay. If it's not on the agenda, then you're open meeting laws again. You, you have to have actually say that it, it's open for public comment to give everybody in the public a chance to come in and comment on it. Okay. So just one more time. If two or more board members ask for something to be on the agenda and it's on the agenda only if part of that agenda says welcomes public comment, will, will public comment be allowed, votable or not? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Mr. Harrell. Thank you, Mr. Green. Um, I'm against this policy. We were elected by our districts to be their voice. Our email and phone numbers are typically published and available. So if somebody has an issue with something that we're doing, they can reach out and discuss it. We can put them in touch with administrator, a superintendent, assistant superintendent, whoever's over the issue. I think we're opening ourselves up to a lot of issues with possible open meetings law, commenting on every agenda item that, that's just not necessary. The second part of this, um, this blue outline about getting on the agenda, we already have a similar policy. So we're kind of duplicating this for no reason. Thank you. Ms. Hanson. I'd like to ask the question in, in terms of what, how did we come to the number just two out of 15 board members? Okay. Because really, honestly, it, any person that is elected up here is elected to represent constituents. So just because someone is elected as a board president or vice president or committee chair, that's only because you trusted us enough to give us that opportunity, but not because we're allowed to make decisions for you or get information we don't share. We're all equal. So if anyone on the board wants to add an agenda item, they should be able to. But let's face it, board members do not get drug tested or mental health checked or anything else. So just as a safety net, we're going to have somebody else agree because who knows what could happen if only one person got to add anything they wanted. So if I can convince you that my crazy idea is a good idea for the agenda and get at least one of you on board, then it can be added. But it's not going to go to just the board president and the superintendent um, to determine whether or not it's something that really should be on the agenda because that's only two perspectives looking at that and only one of them was actually elected by the people. So in order to do our jobs as public servants, we have to be able to hear their voice and react to the need. Does that make sense? It, it does, but I guess what, you know, what my concern is, I, I understand what you say that, you know, if two people, um, it's not just one person saying, okay, I want this on the agenda. You're bouncing it off someone else and getting their support as well. Uh -huh. However, with a 15 member board, uh -huh. that means we could have seven, di you know, different, all of us. And because it's policy, we now need to add those seven uh -huh. on top of those things that the administration um, knows has to be discussed because it's, you know, pertinent to um, timetable. Um, so it's, I, I understand what you're saying about um, us. You don't have to be an elected uh, chairperson or elected on the board as a president or vice president, but I just feel like the, the, the threshold of two out of 15 represents too small a percentage to, you know, dictate what the agenda would be. Well, I mean, I'm, le I'm reading later on that you would have to have 100% um, of the board members to agree, and that may be, is that the same one? To add something that night. 
So I would think that you'd have to have at least 50% of the board in agreement. That would be, you know, I just feel like, or even six out of 15. So that's not quite 50%, but that's, you know, I think if you can't get six of your, you know, um, counterparts to recognize that this is an issue that we feel needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed soon, you know, and I, I strongly believe that if, and maybe I'm just naive about this, but I believe that if we have six of us that talk to the board president and vice president, you know, and the superintendent said six out of 15 of us really want this on the agenda, then it would be on the agenda. But I would think we need to, you know, even one fifth is not, three members is, is not to me sufficient enough to warrant us, you know, individually or in a small group set an agenda. That's just, I respect where you're coming from also. Thank you. Ms. Lamy. I forgot my whole train of thought and why I buzzed in, but, um, but I do understand what you say and I really do. I respectfully disagree wholeheartedly, but I do think that with this board, that's probably possible. Um, you didn't serve the previous four years and it wouldn't have been. Um, but I am open to whatever anybody needs to say. I just think it's really important for us to be able to do our job that we have, you know, it's a school board meeting where school board members make policy and adopt and finalize. And if you don't feel like you have a role in that, it kind of count, it just, what are we doing here? So that's my, my thought process. But that is not why I buzzed in. Um, what, what started this whole thing for me? See what happens? Like there's a squirrel. I forgot. <laughs> All right, well, I guess I'll give up my space, but I reserve the right to do it again. Oh, wait, no, something about Mr. Harrell. That's what it was. What did you say, Brandon? Something about you don't like this policy because of what? Oh, because we have a process similar. That's what it was. Thank you. Okay, so the process similar is if you would like something added to the agenda, you can send it to the president. The president and the superintendent talk about it and decide if it's added to the agenda. Well, what did you just say? Two board members can request a special meeting. Special meeting? Where's that? It's, it's one of our policies. You've got to read all the policies to but see. But that has nothing to do with, uh, a special meeting has nothing to do with the agenda. Like, yes, we could talk. You mean like have a whole different meeting because of a topic? Yeah. Yeah, or, no, that's silly. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about get something on the agenda for but, the two meetings we have to But do. as a board member, you could say, hey, we're going to have a special meeting unless you put it on the agenda. But why would I do that to my other board members? That would just be... Well, it takes two board members to get something on the agenda. Yeah, I understand that. No, I'm going to stick with this one. Another. I'm not going to have a separate meeting, yeah. yeah. Ms. Rutherford. Okay. Well, I think um, I understand what you're saying. However, six people, to get six people together and contact everybody on a short, limited time on a Friday at noon to get something on the agenda for the following week would be really difficult. I think two people, if two people, I mean, I'm, I am a voice for my constituents and Ms. F Ms. Fauntleroy is a voice for her constituents. We both have a voice for them. It's a lot of people. So if two people say we need to add something to the agenda, why not add it? I don't think we can have a problem where we can have lots of board members always wanting to add something to the agenda. But if we feel it's important enough to add it, it should be heard and added. I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. If it becomes a big deal where it's way so many things added to the agenda, maybe we need to revisit it. But I really do think that it shouldn't be that difficult to add something to the agenda that we think is very important. That's just my opinion. And I, I like the idea that y'all came up with the two people. Mr. Terrell. Ms. Rutherford said, um, we're, we're elected to be the voice of the people. I don't, I still don't see why we need to have discussion on every item. And like I said, the policy already states it takes two people to create a special meeting or get on the agenda. So I, this is kind of duplicating what we already have and what we've been having. So if people couldn't get on the agenda, when I was president, I never turned anybody down to get on the agenda. <laughs> Any board members? But I'm sorry if the board members did not read our policy and know how to actually get anything done. Okay. 
Mr. Bro. Thank you. Um, if, well, a couple of things. Okay. If, if it only requires two people to call a special meeting, then I think two people to get something on the agenda is appropriate. Uh, second, if you, if you needed to have a larger group, then you run into a possibility of a rolling quorum. Because you're going to ask, you're going to have to ask every board member whether they want to put something on the agenda, and if half of them disagree, you need to at least talk to at least eight. You're over the quorum, yeah. so um, I, let's try two. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Doctor Peters, sorry, that's all right. Um, <clears throat> I concur with some of the comments that I've heard, in, in both going in both directions, but uh, I certainly. Um, Pause when you say you represent your constituents, and that is absolutely what we're here to do. And what your constituents feel is important out of your community needs to be brought forward through their representative. And to do anything that would uh, cause that to be slowed or like anything that would not expedite that opportunity is, is a deterrent. And so this is just an effort to give us a little more flexibility, uh, greater opportunity for voice from our community and, and representation from our community more directly. And uh, I don't think we need to deter from it. I think we, we haven't done this before. So doing this is just an opportunity. And, and uh, I don't have a crystal ball to say that it's gonna be a great activity or, or it's gonna be something that we regret. But uh, I sure would like to put my foot forward with my constituents at, in mind and, and make this happen. So anyway, thank you. Ms. Hanson? Just to follow up, I don't want it to appear that I'm trying to deter individuals from speaking at a board meeting. My, and again, I said I may be naive about this, but my, my thoughts would be that if I'm representing this district, and even if I'm just myself representing the district and it's a number of people and I talk to a couple of board members and say, hey, this is a, a big issue. And I bring it to the board president and the superintendent. I would expect that they would put it on, not because it's written in the policy, but because that's good governance. So I understand more what you're saying now with the two. And I definitely understand. I don't want to break any, break any meeting laws. But um, and I, I do want the constituents, our constituents throughout the parish to have a voice. Ms. Lamy? The one last thing I was gonna say is I do understand what you're saying about um, Rosalind when you said, you know, what if seven people want to add something on one night, you know, and I guess I wasn't thinking that there's that many things that people would wanna get on the agenda, but I guess it could become that. Um, and so I would think that at that point, maybe either the president or something could like reach back out and say, you know what, this week we have like three other board members adding something. Could it wait till next month? You know what I mean? Or something like that so that we wouldn't have a seven hour meeting. You know what I mean? Uh, that's just a thought that just popped in my head after you said that. Thanks everyone. Um, I don't see any other further board comments, so let's please vote. And that motion carries 13 yeas, one nay. Uh, next item on the agenda is recommends acceptance of revisions to school board policy BCBI, public participation in school board meetings. Do I have a motion? Mr. Bro? <laughs> Second by Ms. Herstus. Herstus, sorry. Uh, any public comments? Yes, sir. <laughs> Keep it on the motion, sir. <laughs> Referencing, again, paragraph six on page one of the uh, school board policy. Uh, talks about defamatory comments, accusatory comments, any comments relative to performance. Uh, to clarify, to declare someone's statements as defamatory requires that an oppositional opinion be proclaimed. And there's no opportunity to adjudicate the truthfulness 
of that speech, so it becomes one's opinion over another. Or when a governmental ent entity silences one opinion over another in a public setting, it's known judicially as viewpoint discrimination. The same can be said for accusatory or comments relative to performance. This is viewpoint discrimination. It is also a pernicious requirement in that it absolutely chills public input that could possibly offend. The school board cannot squelch speech that you do not like, disagree with, or that you might find offensive in some way. This is protected by our Constitution. The board's current policy is clearly unconstitutional. Simply tolerating input by pasteurizing it to the point of being completely inconsequential does nothing. In fact, it does worse than nothing. It damages the republic we live in. It creates an oligarchy that tolerates little input and no dissent from those it governs. You have an opportunity to become more transparent, not less, to allow more input, not less, to be more responsive to those that elected you, not less. Paragraph six of the current board policy needs to be significantly edited to eliminate these unconstitutional requirements. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Osborne. Okay. Um, so I, I, I do think that was a healthy start, um, the last policy, and they do, these two dovetail, I think. Um, and again, I, when folks come down here, I want them to leave having their voice heard. I, I, don't, I just don't want those, those feelings to, to bubble up and boil over. So there's a lot here that has caused friction in the past, and I think a few simple tweaks can help. Board meetings by board policy start at 7 p.m. That's what it says in the board policy unless otherwise designated. But we've been doing them at 6 p.m. I'm not saying to change that. But when it comes to signing up, you have to sign up 15 minutes before. So that would be 5.45 p.m. And we've been having the meetings, uh, the open comments at the end of the meetings for many months. But here, according to board policy, they're supposed to be at the beginning. All that's fine, but I just suggest that it not be at 5.45. Some people miss it by minutes. If they're going to sit here through the whole meeting, why can't they sign up until right before the public comments or something like that? The traffic is brutal. You guys know that. The traffic is absolutely brutal. I just don't want any constituent, my constituents, your constituents, there's a lot of crossover there, to be denied the chance to, to address the board. Um, and I just think it's, it's one of the things, our board's not unique in that. Some do have this like Jefferson, but I think it's a piece that, that really adds value and just making it more accessible, whatever that would look like. But I just think having them sign up by 4, 5.45 p.m. is arbitrary and, and blocks a lot of comment. Um, in addition, um, there's some things at the end. I, I get there's not supposed to be a back and forth, but we've, uh, you've adopted something where a person can ask a question rhetorically and then somebody can ask staff to answer it or you can choose to address it. If that could be reflected in the writing so that maybe somebody that's never been down here knows they can ask a rhetorical question in the hopes that it be answered. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. So I'm just throwing those few things out there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Any other public comment? <clears throat> See none. Our, we'll queue up the board members. Ms. Lamy, you're first. I was just going to say um, one thing. Um, I really do agree with what Mr. Osborne said, and I don't know the best way. I don't know how, but I just know that I've had so many people reach out to me and say, I work until 5 o'clock. I'm trying to get here. Or teachers from, like, Slidell saying, like, I try to get there, and I miss the cutoff. I don't know the answer. I know Christy has to deal with public comments. I know, you know, I, I thought maybe, like, for committee as a whole, if we left, like, the sign up for the second meeting, out in the atrium and picked it up a few minutes before, but I don't know if, what we would do for the other. I don't know the answer, but I do think that we tie a lot of hands because the same people can't make it one week at that time, still can't make it the next week or the next week. So I, I don't know if that's something we can talk about. Um, and the other thing I was going to say, oh, um, is with the gentleman. Um, I'm so sorry, I should know your name. I feel like your first name is Jeffrey, but I don't know, isn't it? Mr. Well, Richards. Okay, Mr. Richards. I wanted to say the right name. Um, I, I don't like what he said, but I do agree with what he said. Um, 
So I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I feel like we could say we respectfully request no blah, 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 blah. And that's a request. Like we're just asking you. I mean, obviously we can't kick you out of the meeting if you say Tammy's a jerk, but I might get up and walk to the back. Like, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, y'all know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to do something that's unconstitutional and trying to block someone's speech. I think it's horribly awful to listen to people um, come up here and just try to tear you down. Um, I get very hard on them. But I do think that I want to, I want to do what's, so does that make sense? Okay. Just want to, you know, maybe I wish people would be nice, but I don't think we can make them. Ms. McCollum. Uh, I want to ask in reference to uh, the correction at the beginning of the meeting, we're changing that to prior to the end. And in my interpretation, that means any time during the meeting based on prior to the end of each meeting means we could do it at any time. That means it's speak at the end instead of beginning now. Right, but using the term, using the terminology prior to the end of the meeting means to me, when is that going to be? It's going to be before the end of the meeting, but when? So if you want it at the end of the meeting, I think the statement needs to say at the end of the meeting. I guess it's kind of legal nom nomenclature because it's not necessarily the last thing at the end of the meeting. It's Those are generally uh, board announcements and things like that. But I see what you, right. I mean, I, I but think to me, prior to the end there. of the meeting, meaning it could be any time during the meeting. Just as long as it's prior to the end. But that just may be a play on words, and that just may be the way I'm interpreting it. Yeah, we're, I think we're just talking about three-minute public comment here, um, and which we which we have put at the end of the meeting. Uh, so, Mr. Brough? Well, I, I can see Ms. Uh, McCollum's point, um, but it... It will be published on the agenda, and right. it will be handled at the point where it's published. And so if we have the flexibility to put it anywhere, but it will be right before the comments are near the end. It's not at the end because you still have an adjournment. Right. Uh, and and uh, I think the messages from the president are at prior to the adjournment. So yeah. it's very near the end, but it's not at the end. We'll just leave it a big surprise for the public. Those <laughs> never know when it's going to be. So, any other comments? We have a motion on the floor. Let's please vote. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see anybody else in the queue. We'll open it back up. Ms. Rutherford? I believe you hit the button. Right. Before we vote, I'm wondering, you know, the gentleman who spoke about that paragraph um, with free speech, I mean, I am for free speech, and I think people should be able to say things. Like Tammy said, we hope they say it nicely without, you know, very derogatory comments or, you know, cursing or whatever. But I do think they should have their voice heard, and sometimes people get angry because they're so riled up in what they want to say, and, and sometimes it does get a little harsh, you know? And um, so I, the way this is written, I think we need to look at how it's written before we vote. I don't know. Can we look at it again before we vote? Can I make a motion that we look at this, how it's written, because of the freedom, you know, freedom of speech? Does anybody else think that should be? Is, can I make a motion that we revisit this and work on that wording because of how it is written that they can i make a recommendation yeah please um, i don't know but you know something because what mr richards brings up is good points and we should probably mm -hmm. tackle that it's it's not quite the policy that we're getting changed with this amendment we're we're basically just it's it kind of dovetails into what we we provided in the previous uh policy in terms mm -hmm. of allowing public to speak on uh, non-motionable uh, agenda items, so things that we're not going to vote on. So my recommendation is that we 
we vote on this, and then we address the defamatory comments in another meeting when it's properly on the agenda and we've had time to look at that. Does that make sense? I guess. If we do that. Yeah. I think we, okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Green, we need to look at the, the law more closely because given, a, you know, people, we all have free speech, but as we all learned in civics, we have limits to those free speech. Mm -hmm. And in an and, and informal um, situation such as board meetings or at, you know, the state capitol or there are certain things in place uh, that, you know, may appear to limit somebody's free speech, but there's, the, there's a lot of law out there and, and court cases that demonstrate that there are um, cases where it can be limited. And I, I, I'm concerned about, I know you said address another time, but us giving a form for someone to um, s slander another person um, or speak about an employee, which could be a confidentiality, put us in a, in a legal situation with confidentiality. And, and I think that's you're, primary. I, my, yeah, primary. and I think that's exactly what I want to make sure that we confirm with legal on that specific item rel relative to that paragraph, that we have some some harder discussions about that and make sure that we're not doing anything against the law as it relates to specific employees or their performance or something along those lines. Yes, sir, Mr. Harrison. Look, I just want to make a few comments. Mr. Richards does make some excellent points. This language is difficult to implement. I want you to understand two things. There are multiple Louisiana Attorney General opinions, including one specific to this board that has upheld that language. There's one from 2004, and there's one regarding, I think, a different school board, and there's one regarding this one. The art to applying the policy is what matters. And what you're dealing with is this reality, okay? If you take it out, when someone comes to defame you or come when someone comes to insult an employee, some of those employees won't even be here. And I've, I promise you, this is a limited public forum. So you have the power to pull all public comments. They, the public will hate this idea. You won't be able to pass it. So it's not gonna happen, in my opinion. But when you allow public comments, you have the ability to regulate it because of where we are. But if you take this out, it's not going to offend me. I'm telling you, your employees, and you are going to regret it. And it plays out like this. Someone stands up to the podium and they use a name. So-and-so, I think you're an absolute idiot. And that's not a curse word. And then you don't get to comment on it. Because to do so is to violate the possibility of going outside the open meetings law. It ends in chaos. I've seen it happen. It happens in New Orleans City Council. It happens in Mandeville. It happens in Abita. And then they start looking at legal counsel like, hey, get the meeting back together so we stay on track and follow Title 42. All I can tell you is the language in the policy is weak, the way Mr. Richards has outlined. The case law supports it. But it's really for you all to decide what you want. And if you allow the public to insult you, you're going to be able to sit there and not insult them back. So you're going to be able to not comment back. And see, that's where it gets unfair. So here's the deal. If you want to be insulted, take it out. But then you're going to have to come around and sign up on public comment so you can readdress your comments to the public comments. Now, here's another one. School boards are very unique under Louisiana law. It's 42 colon 15. Ms. Barrios is very familiar with this provision. Public comments are required only for each voting item. So if you're going to list something on the agenda and it requires a vote, you have to allow public comments per item. Well, what this board does is you have public comments on every agenda requiring a vote and then you allow public comments on almost anything at the end of your agenda. And it comes very close to content neutrality, okay? I promise you. But to allow absolute content neutrality is practically impossible. So that's how it works. That's, I've read hundreds of constitutional cases. So it's not a function of anyone being wrong. It's not anybody being right either. It's you got to realize at some point you're going to limit the content of speech. 
And here's the deal, whether you're in a school board meeting or whether it's a public sign, at some point, you're gonna have a heightened scrutiny applied by the court system if you start regulating content too much. But it, when it becomes objectively offensive to this board or the public, you're gonna be able to regulate it. One last thing, Mr. Richards, said, Mitch Richards raised an excellent point. If you put something on the agenda and it's up for discussion, you have to allow both points of view. So you cannot regulate someone who's gonna say something that you don't like. That's 100%, that's called viewpoint perspective. But this policy doesn't deal with that. This policy deals with insults that can be levied against you and school employees who aren't even here to defend themselves. But that's how it works. That's what this is about. That's why the language is in there. You're informed now. It's not really subject to debate. It's whatever you want. I'll support you either way. Leave the policy as it is, take it out. It's your policy under 17 colon 81. That's the board's prerogative. Thank you, Mr. Thank Harrison. You. So we have a motion on the floor to um, change language um, to the policy um, or add language, excuse me, um, for public comments on non-voting items. I don't see any, is there anybody else queued up? Okay, good. Uh, The only way to address that would be th uh, through an amendment to what we have currently on the floor. But we can, like, uh, like address that later. Like, if we pass this, mm -hmm. then maybe we can come back later and say, hey, we want to change the time. Yep. You just need one school board member now. <laughs> Two. One, one, one on top of yourself. Well, one yeah, on top one of in, me. In, yeah. In, on, okay. In yourself. So. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but um, <laughs> just one and another one. Okay. One and one, one plus one. <laughs> Nobody on top of anyone. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. Let's please vote. Yes. And that motion carries 11 yeas, two nays, and one abstention. The next item is recommends acceptance of school board policy EDD, school bus scheduling and routing. Mr. Alfonso. Thank you, Chairman Green, Superintendent Jabby, and Board. Uh, what you have in front of you, uh, we provided you the law, the policy, basically scratched, read it out in line through, and the new policy. Really, this is just an update to policy EDD to reflect the law. The only thing I'd like to do, just to highlight some real uh, short points on what the law addresses, it does address the loading and unloading of students, the safety devices on buses, identifiable lettering, when the amber lights are, when you turn on your amber lights before a stop. And basically it says all buses come to a complete stop when loading and unloading, and then the color of the buses. All of this stuff, uh, our bus owner operators and bus operators do a magnificent job of already addressing these issues. What you have before you is just a policy update to reflect the law. So uh, I have that for you. Any, I'll be ready to answer any questions if you ha have any. Thank you, Mr. Alfonso, and I move to uh, move to accept that uh, policy. Do I have a second? Mr. Bro seconds that motion. Any co comments from the public? Seeing none, any from the board? Is that still from Wallaga? Okay. Ms. Hurstis? <clears throat> um, on here, it does say that, um, that the students have the responsibility to be there for the bus driver at a timely manner. From what I understand, um, what type of, I guess, ramifications are there for the school or the administrators if they keep allowing bus drivers to go back for students that are tardy all the time? 
we need to, that's, that needs to come to a halt because there's too many bus drivers that keep going back and it's just, it's causing mayhem. Yes, ma'am. Uh, currently the practice that we have in place is we do send buses back when it's the school's fault. Like if you're talking after school, before school. No, I'm talking about to get to school. Like oh, the, yeah. the kids say sleep in, you know, five, 10 minutes and they're not there. Well, then the, the, their bus driver has to then go back and pick up this tardy student. Yes, ma'am. You're saying go back to the stop and pick up the tardy yes. student. Well, that's pretty hard to address. Uh, we do we do push special needs drivers to go back because sometimes it takes some time to do that. Uh, what we do is when we find out those things are occurring, we get with the administration of the school to address it with the parent. And then when it occurs, then we start you know, our process with the student if it keeps occurring. And what if though, I mean, what's what's the process though of the bus drivers telling the administrator or, and the administrator just doesn't do anything after that? That's when they need to alert us so we can address it. But I just okay. want to make you aware of something. In the morning, by law, we can't leave a student a student on side of the road. If a student is there or walking to the stop. Well, yeah, the if they're driver, there. But yeah, if they're but, not there and the bus leaves. But if, yes, I do understand what you're saying. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But if a kid, say, if a kid's walking to a stop and just happens to miss the bus, they call in on the radio, the bus is in the vicinity, we do send it back to the stop because we can't leave any students there. Okay, so, but they, bus drivers can address it to you, or can we make sure that it, they, because it's been addressed to us numerous times yes, that the bus drivers are having issues with this. Yeah, so what they need to do is alert the administrators. If the administrators doesn't address it, then it can get to us and we can address it with the administrator. Okay, is there something that we could maybe put on the agenda to make sure, or how, I mean, what, what's the backup plan on this? We want to make sure that this gets taken care of. Uh, we would like to you to give us an opportunity to address it before it comes to agenda item. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Lamy. Just a quick question. Lewis, with the new um, bus software, I don't know, with the new bus software, they'll like actually scan in and we'll know who's on the bus, right? Yes. Is there a way to set it up that if they're not on the bus, an immediate text goes out and say, you missed your bus, bring your kid to school or something like that? Like, is that doable? <laughs> Well, I mean, it, that would be pretty cool, right? Because then a kid wouldn't be on the street corner because that is very right. dangerous. You, yeah. you don't know who's supposed to be riding and who's not, so they could be sick. But it uh, does alert the parent when the student does get on the bus. Get on the bus. Okay. All right, well. <laughs> we have a motion. Oh, Mr. Brown. I know it's not appropriate to this motion, but sometime. Yeah, we'll, we'll address that in the transportation update, if we have one. Um, so we have a motion, a second, no more board comments. Let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Alfonso. Our administrative report, I'll turn it over to Mr. Kose. Thank you, Chairman Green, Superintendent Javia, and Board. Uh, my administrative update to the Board tonight will act as a segue into my agenda item B coming up, which will bring forward the request for approval of a new policy regarding the distribution or dispensing of naloxone or other opioid antagonists. The 2022-23 school year has included a large percentage of drug cases brought before our two hearing officers for expulsion proceedings. Of the expulsion hearings held this year, 32% have been drug cases or drug related. St. Tammany Parish has witnessed all too often the loss of life due to poor choices regarding drugs. A new standing order, which is brand new in January 2023 from the Louisiana Department of Health, protects individuals that administer opiate antagonists, the generic naloxone or the brand Narcan, if you've heard of, et cetera, and highlights the drug concerns at our front door. An example took place two Fridays ago, whereas the St. Tammany Parish Sheriff's Office narcotics detectives found marijuana 
laced with fentanyl and pills laced with fentanyl during a traffic stop. Another example is from a neighboring parish where as a 19-year-old male was charged with second-degree murder for selling to a 15-year-old female what she thought was a Percocet pill. The pill was pressed with pure fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid drug 100 times more potent than morphine. Ingesting or even just handling through skin absorption may cause an overdose that can result in coma and respiratory failure leading to death. Just yesterday on the news, if you're watching the news, there were two New Orleans police officers who had to have Narcan administered to them for simply handling the substance. They ingested it through their skin absorption. Our school resource officers currently possess naloxone. The new policy, item B, that we're bringing to you shortly would add another layer of protection for our students and employees on our campuses. And I'm open to any questions regarding the information I just presented prior to me getting to item B. I'll open up the queue, Ms. Moore. Fine. So as I understand this, all school nurses, if I'm reading, if I'm going before I'm your topic right now, stop me, <laughs> will have the authority or have this on campus. So we'll have two people on but campus. That would be besides the SROs carrying it currently, correct? Wonderful, because yes, I've spoken with the nurses and they're very excited to be part of a solution. Yes, ma'am. It's going to Rick. Thank you so much. Yes, Ms. Baker. I just want to make sure that we're protecting our um, employees in that. So is there some sort of good Samaritan law that if they... Is there a, okay, what would happen if you gave this drug thinking someone was overdosing and in fact they weren't? And and are they protected by law um, to misread that? I mean, because we're not, um, to say that only, like, for example, if the nurse is out sick and there's, and, and an administrator or somebody panics thinking the child is ODN or staff member or whatever, and they give this, I, I mean, I just want to make sure that, number one, they're in good faith trying to save someone's life and that nobody can sue anybody in case they weren't. Uh, I'll jump ahead to some of the documents you have before you. That, I'm sorry. That, that's okay. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, no, ma'am, but I'm, I'm going to try and answer your question, Ms. Baker. Um, okay. On... Revised statute, it's one of the documents on, on that you have on board docs. It's the one of the two revised statutes. Um, it's revised statute 17436.1. If you skip all the way to the third page, which is the last paragraph of that revised statute, it does read that it authorizes a school to maintain a supply of naloxone or other opioid antagonists and authorizes a school nurse or other school employee to administer naloxone or other opioid antagonist to any student or other person on school grounds in the event of an actual perceived opioid emergency. Now, if you read on, there, there has to be training, um, specific training in order for those persons to be better protected. Right, and so maybe is that like a big deal training or, I mean, like, no, I, I don't know no, how no, many people you would train. In, in the policy, we have some of the, some of the information that we have written in the policy with the bullets that we have, that's some of the information. And the, poli the training is not, um, to me, it doesn't look like a whole lengthy type of training that we're looking at, you know, over days, time, or whatever. I do have someone here that can answer that question probably better than me, which is our um, nurse practitioner that we have on staff. And her title is uh, Health and Safety Coordinator. Ms. Neely Estrada is here, if you want. Neely, can you answer that better, please? <laughs> can you come up to the podium? I mean, I, I'm just thinking. She, she's familiar with the training. Okay, thank you. And give you a ballpark of what it looks like. I understand. Good evening. To answer your question, we will have training that will take place with all 55 of our nurses that will encompass um, from safe schools training, on hands training, demonstration. Most of our nurse, excuse me, all of our nurses know how to administer this medication 
and have, have been familiar with it in the clinic and hospital setting as well as in the school with seizure medication. It's the same kind of dispensing. Intranasal is what it's going to be, and that is um, a medication they're all familiar with. I just want protection for our employees in the event that a nurse is not there and that someone is in all good faith trying to save someone's life. And is, is there a danger if this drug is administered and they're not ODing, but they might be seizing or something? Correct. There is not a danger associated if a person has taken opioids and is given this drug, it would reduce it would reverse the effect. It binds to the opioid receptors in the brain. If someone is having, if they're passed out and we don't have a response and they are given it and it's for other causes, it would do no harm. There are no antagonists to bind to because what it is is a, it binding to those receptors of the drug. So if the drug is not present, it has nothing to bind to. Sure. Ms. Hansen. Quick question or clarification, Mr. Kose, when it says that the nurse is trained in it and other employees are allowed, are we training more than just the nurse? And then the follow-up question also is, the police, our SROs are trained to, to administer it, correct? So they would be able to, so on a campus you'd have perhaps two people. My concern is with the large campuses like the high schools where we're more likely to see something like this. You know, would we train more than just the nurse? We could, Ms. Hansen, and uh, it, it could be training from our nurses that are trained, from what I'm reading. So like at our high schools, they have, Ms. Stradiburger, they have EMT technicians, I mean, teachers that, you know, um, my crisis, concern again we, is high schools. With the number of, we have crisis, crisis team, team members, team, yes. and, and yeah. some of those persons, if they want to volunteer, we certainly can get them to training and, and again, cover our campuses better with more persons. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Rafino Gallo. Just a small question. So I was going to ask the same thing. If it's just the nurse and an SRO, there's huge campuses out there that have a lot. But if you're training all these people, I'm assuming this isn't just going to be sitting on the principal's desk out in the open. So are all of these people going to have access to this lock and key? I'm assuming we're not just going to let it sit in the nurse's office. I don't know where are we going to keep it. Again, yeah. I know it's not going to hurt anybody if they're not doing it. But in order, there are people, if they know it's in the school, they are going to try to steal it. It, it, will, be, it will be in a secure place uh, where those individuals that are trained to administer will have access to it. I said that it will be in a secure location to whereas those individuals who have been trained to administer will have access to it. Ms. McCullough? Just a quick question, and this is for me not being involved <laughs> directly. We do have full-time nurses at all the campuses. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Ms. Fauntleroy. I just wanted to clarify for Ms. Baker. In the I think I know what you were asking. In the revised statute that Mr. Coxley has a copy of, it's point F. It's sort of a good, it says you can't be held criminally or civilly liable with, in good faith. Mr. Bro, thank you. Um, this disregards uh, Ms. Hansen's comment. In the very large campuses, um, the SRO typically sits near the front office, and the nurse is typically near the front office. And well, and and our campus, uh, Slidell High, it could take ten minutes to get to the back where the, uh, the ag people were raising their cattle. Uh, uh, I encourage the training of multiple employees and possible the distribution of several places where the the uh, drug can be um, gotten to in a in a hurry because ten minutes could save a life. Yes, sir. Okay, we have no further board comments, so let's please vote. Uh, there was no motion. I didn't oh, get, I'm sorry. I didn't get to item B yet. 
You're that right. Was my administrative, but that like was we my covered it all, you know? I'm, I'm thinking we had something on the floor there. Well, you were so thorough. I'll be you know? brief if, if, you, if you don't mind. Um, so in, consult, in, in consulting with Forethought, also our attorney uh, leading, looking over this, our health and safety coordinator, you just met Mrs. Estrade, which she better known as NEO, uh, and our HR director, Ms. Lori Niehaus, reviewed this for us as well. Um, so we have a new policy before you. Um, we have the final policy that's, that's clean. Um, you have two revised statutes, and you have the standing order that I mentioned that has just been in, put in place this January of 2023. So the policy would provide that our school nurses would have possession of naloxone in the event of this type of medical emergency, and we're recommending and asking you to approve this. Thank you, Mr. Cosey. Do I have a motion? Ms. Moore, do I have a second? Mr. Harrell, any comments from the public? Yes, Dr. Ms. Ferry. So I do, I'm Stephanie Underwood. Um, I appreciate this policy because I know it's a lot and we need to have this. Um, and I do know that our nurses are all for this because they do care about the health uh, and safety of our students. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up is I would like to see, because nurses have brought to our attention, we'd like to see like some kind of like camera area by the medicine. So that way, if the nurse isn't there and somebody else is there and then it gets blamed on the nurse because it's missing, you know, so keep that in mind, but I do appreciate this policy. Thank you. Any other public comment? How about from the board? Now we can vote. And that motion carries unanimously. Uh, Mr. Cosay, our maintenance and custodial report. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, you have your monthly maintenance and custodial report before you, and our uh, maintenance supervisor, Mr. Wade Gottschalk, is here to answer any questions regarding that report. Any questions for Mr. Gottschalk? I see none. Our transportation report. And before you, the monthly transportation report, and Dr. Grant Gerald is here to answer any questions regarding that report. I think Mr. Bro had one. Which that may be Mr. Bouillon answering that question. Yes, it, it's it's involving buses, but could you briefly give me a status of the software? We've installed 241 buses to date, and the remainder are older buses that require uh, cabling or direct cabling. So we've provided that to transportation, and they're in the process of installing those. So of the 241 that are installed, do the parents have access to the app to to uh, to see where the bus is at any time? We haven't rolled out the app yet. What we're trying to do is get all the buses installed so that we can roll out the entire parish at one time so that we don't have a lot of questions. Why is this bus done and not this bus so that we don't create that issue? So that's why we're pushing hard to get all of the buses done. We have an anticipated date. That would be transportation. I guess that would be. <laughs> How about an ETA, Dr. G? Just a ballpark. Okay. Thank you. And we also, the tablets are starting to arrive as well, too. So we're going to start that. In I know that's the next step. I, I thought we'd do small steps and get them on the buses first and, and let them track the buses. But the eventual goal is you'll know if your student is on that bus at any time. So six to eight weeks, I guess, or a month, six to a month to six weeks is to get them installed on the buses and get the app available so that we know where the buses are. Yes. The tablets aren't even here yet. So what's the de date anticipated on that? The uh, ship dates that we're anticipating are the 20th of February, we're starting to receive the equipment, and we actually have professional installers coming in to install that, so we would have to schedule that. So it would be... Um, April Fool's Day? No, really close. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
I just have two questions. I see that there was a may, uh, class, I guess, February 1st through 3rd, which is yesterday through tomorrow. Oh, I'm like, who? Um, yeah. Do we know how, how many people do we have in that? Because is that, that for, that's for news pers perspective, sorry, school bus drivers? Yes, ma'am. There's eight um, individuals in that class that started yesterday. It's okay. a, they have to go through all three days, and then we keep moving them through the process to get their CDL license, um, behind the wheel uh, training, um, and jump through those hoops. Okay. Number two. Um, are the the technology that y'all are discussing, is that on all buses, owner-operated and school board-owned buses? Correct. It, it will be. Correct. Okay. Um, and there's another class for attendance in February and another class in March. Or, yeah. yeah. Yes, how do people go about signing up for that? Like, if we know, we know people that might be interested, how do they do that? We try to hold classes monthly. Okay. And um, there is a link on the school board website that um, as people would go to to apply, they click the link and submit their name, phone number, um, email address, and they can leave a short message. But that message comes immediately to um, myself and the assistant director that deals with personnel, uh, personnel management, and then we contact them and start them through the process. Okay, and just out of curiosity, if these people take this class and pass, do we have buses for them at the moment, or at this point, do they need to be owner operators? We have buses, and we um, can add them to a substitute list. Um, right now, we're at about 50% as far as the people who are coming through the class wanting to become a substitute or wanting to become a full-time driver, okay. and we need both desperately. Okay, thank you. Ms. Fauntleroy? Real quickly, just to clarify, when you start tracking the kids on the bus, that's going to be off of the lanyard the ID they wear that operates the key to the doors as well? Yes, same, same card access. So when they leave it at home the next morning, they won't have a key or be trackable? No, the, what happens is there's a tablet on the bus, the names of when they arrive at a specific stop based on the GPS location, it displays who's supposed to be getting on the bus. As the students tap their badges, it would remove the names so that any student that did not have a badge, the bus driver or the student could tap their name and it would check them in automatically. Okay. Ms. Martin. So what happens, we've been getting reports from bus drivers that there are students that are kind of choosing their bus stop, right? Maybe they live in a nearby neighborhood and they miss their bus stop so they know that they can go two streets over and that bus doesn't come for another 15 minutes after they miss their bus and so they go over there. Um, what happens if that student tries to get on a bus that's not their bus? Mr. Alfonso is going to answer that. Um, as I said earlier, Ms. Ms. Reed, um, we, Martin Reed, sorry, Martin, the, if a student, we have to take the student, we have to follow the chain of command also. That student is brought to the administrator and we, got, we give the administrator the, uh, the opportunity to address it. If it becomes a problem, then, you know, we'll start our discipline processes, but there's a process in place where the administrator contacts the parents, the parents address it. If it continues, then, you know, the student faces discipline. Now, if it's the same bus, sometimes that's not addressed. You know, if it's the same bus, but if they're hopping buses, that's when it becomes an issue because right. of capacity. So most of our buses are full, yes? Dr. Gerald, you have to answer that. Yes, ma'am. So what happens <laughs> when we have students that might be doing this and that bus is already at capacity for that bus driver's route. So now you have kids that technically should be on bus A, you know, tally count for students. And now they're trying to hop on a separate bus and now we're over capacity and there's not enough seats for these students or students are standing. Um, and that, okay. that, stu that student, Ms. Martin, has just created a problem for us. Big time. And, and it needs to be addressed. And that's where 
the administrator and the transportation department works hand in hand to address that. And if they don't, then we should hear about it. Um, we're, 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 we're available to hear something that is maybe festering or growing and the school's not handling it, the transportation department's not handling it, and it's our job to make sure that they do handle it and because it is a safety issue um, and, it's, and it's also an organizational issue for our system. Who is the, the first, I guess, chain of command? Is it the administrator at the school, or do they go to you or transportation? Where do they? It's the administrator at the school. At the school, okay. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Because they, the administrator of the school knows those students and knows their student body better than anybody out here. Mm -hmm. Ms. Rutherford? Okay, so we have a bunch of little bitty kids, pre-K, kindergarten, first, second, getting on the bus with they don't usually bring their ID home, most of them. When, I, when I'm hearing is they're leaving them at school and then they take them out at school and put them on. So is that right? That's it. Okay. So they're now going to have to take this ID and wear it every day and put it on the bus? Are they going to punch them in? Or what's going to happen? I they're going to need to carry their IDs because once we implement access control, they won't be able to go through the door. Right. Okay. So I know I work in the office every Friday at Lake Harbor. And I can tell you that I have students who need to come get a temporary ID that day because they don't have their ID that day at school. So what happens to them when they go to get on the bus? They would tap their name as without the ID. On the tablet. Okay, so they'd still be able to get on the bus. We'd still have record of them being on the bus. Yes. And then when they get to school, they're going to get a temporary ID, and I'm not going to be a happy person. Okay. Yes. Okay. And some of the um, elementary schools have... Put it on the student's book bag so that it stays with the student. They're they're getting creative. Yeah, we've given them lanyards and yes. replacements. Thank you. Mr. Harrell. Thank you, sir. I, I hate to do this. I, I'd like to jump back real quick to maintenance. I'd like to congratulate Mr. West Parker on getting the impact award, Mr. Godshaw. Um, one of the things, I, I know you didn't go to the last month's meeting, but uh, Mr. Parker's son actually did our gavel for us. So you need to get on him and get, get another one. Cause I know Wes is pretty amazing. Yeah, he is, he is. So, but show him the gavel. I mean, that's, that's very impressive work that his son did. Thank you. Very nice. It pounds very well. I, I'm, a, I'm assuming crew nine, but he might be on a different crew, huh? Paint crew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cosey for the transportation report. Thank you, Mr. Green finalized there. So we'll move along in our agenda and Ms. Tipton with our construction report. Thank you, Mr. Green. Um, our first item, we're recommending authorization for Superintendent Jabia and or Board President Bro to purchase land situated in Section 3, Township 9 South, Range 14 East, St. Tammany Parish, Louisiana. This property is located on the west side of 9th Street across from Sawdell High School. It's part of a parcel of land that is owned by the Congregation of the First Presbyterian Church of Slidell, and it would be the portion of property that includes a large gym building that also has two-story area with classroom office type spaces, and then some undeveloped land to the north of that gym. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Mr. Bro? do I have a second? It's uh, six hundred thousand dollars, and it's below um, appraisal. Any questions from the public, Mr. Broom? Thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Broom from Slidell, and uh, I'm always in favor, especially for Slidell High. Any time a piece of property becomes available, they need to snap it up. Uh, but I would be interested if the administration has plans or are we getting this for future development or what do we hope to do with this, uh, this resource? Thank you. Ms. Tipton, will you address that? I think initially it, it offers the school some additional gymnasium space and some classroom space. It may give us an opportunity to expand or to relocate and build upon our CTE or AG um, type programs and it may be used for some parking. We'll definitely have to um, 
put our own parking there because the the church will keep their church building and their parking lot so we will be developing some of that to the side of it for our access thank you thank you mr broom any other comments from the public any from the board mr bro Uh, issuance it's, it's not okay um, we generally buy land at a general fund but we didn't budget any so we'll use parish-wide funds we have plenty of funds there to cover good to know land that we can get yes Easy. it's always a good thing to buy land uh, in, in terms of what they're going to use it for um, the gymnasium can be used right away uh, hopefully with some renovations or you know updates we can use the classrooms also we currently have four trailers or, or uh, portables that are in pretty bad shape and, and it's hoped that we can use these classrooms to somehow replace those and that's why I was asking about the color of money because the bond issue was to try to get rid of some of the uh, portables when we could so thank you Ms. Rafino Gallo I'm just looking at the picture and I don't know the answer to it does it cause any concern that it's across the street and there is traffic that would be driving. I know it's a residential neighborhood, but that there would be traffic and kids would be going back and forth across the street. And again, I know they're high school students, but that's, I just have a, just curious. So Ninth Street has most of its traffic um, at the start of the school day, obviously with students parking and what have you, but during the school day itself, and also there would be duty teachers, I would assume, um, available and out there. And we may see if we can work with the city of Slidell for a crosswalk. There may be some opportunities there, too. Okay. No other comments. Uh, let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. Item B, Ms. Tipton. Yes, sir. Are we recommending acceptance of St. Tammany Junior High School elevator addition as substantially complete subject to the architect's recommendations, submission of all regulatory requirements, and approval of Superintendent Javia, St. Tammany Parish School Board Project number P0277. Thank you, Ms. Tipton. Do I have a motion? On behalf of Dennis Cousin, Honorable District 14 school board representative, I would uh, move that we accept this recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Bro. Do I have a second? Dr. Peterson seconds that motion. Do I have any comments from the public? Any from the board? Let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. And item C, construction report. Yes, sir. Um, just a short report. Um, our large capital improvement projects are progressing. The weather lately has definitely been challenging. Um, some recent highlights, though. Um, the masonry walls at Abney Elementary Additions are underway and going up fairly quickly. Furniture is being installed at Bayou Woods Elementary Additions. The structural steel installation at Fountain Blue High Additions have started and they're progressing quickly. And um, the school is transitioning into the renovated kitchen at Lee Road Junior High this week. And our turf installation is complete at Salmon High School. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. Any questions for Ms. Tipton? Mr. Harrell? Thank you, Mr. Green. You know, I'm going to ask how's the Abita Middle project going? Are we? It's going well. Um, that is a project. You know, this. there are some things about construction coming out of the pandemic that have been um, challenging, and Abita is experiencing some things relative to that. They waited a while for um, the main electrical panel, but they did just get in the main breaker that they had been waiting for. The elevator is scheduled to start installation here in just another week or so. And the bigger holdup has been that the chiller delivery continues to get pushed back. So we have temporary air in the building so that they can finish everything, but we are waiting 
and keeping our fingers crossed that the latest delivery date, which is at the end of February, or the ship date is at the end of February, will happen. Great. Perfect. Thank you. I, I tell you, that new entrance is working out great during the day, great. and the, the walkways look great. They really do look good out there. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rafino Galler. Is there any update on um, when or estimated time when uh, Let Alone Committal will be finished? I know it's gotten pushed back, and I was just curious if there is a new Little, end date. Little Oak is also working to get uh, permanent power established. They've had some things that they've had to work through there, and that's a very important milestone to get to, to just be able to install elevators, do some finishes and some things like that. We're looking towards the end of the semester, we think. Um, maybe do a little bit better, but it is a very large building, so, but it's coming along really well, and it's going to be a great facility. Ms. McCullum? I'm just looking at an update. Magnolia Trace, is it still scheduled to be entered in that Phase 1 so the, in March? I the understood. Phase 1 area, yes. Well, that is the goal of the goal. contractor to make it before testing starts because, of course, the school won't be able to make that move right. testing. So we're keeping our fingers crossed, but there's a lot to do, so we'll, we'll see. If not, it we'll It looked we'll like move a lot after. to do to yes, me as well. And it may be after testing. We'll just have to see how it falls out. Okay. But they're, they're definitely working at it and have a goal to make Thank it. you. Ms. Rutherford? I don't have any questions about this, but I do have a kudos I want to tell you. Mr. Peterson, Ms. Martin, and Mr. Harrell and I all went to um, Fifth Ward the other day, Monday, and we were all quite impressed with the improvements of the new building that they have there. They have okay. just moved in, and they're, it was fabulous. It was fabulous. Appreciate that. And the kids who were there visiting, the high schoolers, remember that? They were so excited. They were like, they want to come back. <laughs> so, That's thank great. You. Thank you for saying that. And Mr. Menino oversaw that project and um, everyone that worked on that did a really good job, including the architect and the contractor. Thank you. Came out really good. They sent us home with some sandwiches. I was going to bring it to you, but it, it didn't make it. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Tipton. Thank you. Our internal audit report uh, Mr. Incaprayer is here for any questions related to his monthly audit report. Any questions from Mr. Incaprayer? Uh, um, we'll move along then. Item B is considerations of revisions to school board policy DID. And Ms. Prevost can address that. Yeah, board members, uh, before Ms. Prevost starts, the, the next items are all uh, items that Mr. Incaprayer and Ms. Uh, Prevost brought back to you and brought back to the board members that we're bringing forward uh, to move forward with internal order and processes and all that. So I uh, look forward to hearing from them, but uh, you know, we're, we're here to answer any questions, and Mr. Incaprayer is here, along with Ms. Prevost, if you have any questions about anything coming up. Thank you. Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, the first policy um, is consideration of revisions to school board policy DID audits. Um, we have provided you with a draft revised policy in the original policy with red line changes. Um, the only changes to this policy were basically to add internal auditors in the policy. They weren't in there. And to add schools to the language because schools also get audited. So, um, but I'll be happy to answer any questions on that policy. Okay. Do I have a motion? Mr. Bro? do I have a second? Ms. Baker, any questions from the public? Any from the board? Let's vote. And that motion it motion is supported unanimously. Item C. Okay, the next policy is um, consideration of a new policy DIDA for internal auditing. Um, we um, provided you with the draft policy. We did not previously have a policy just on internal audit. Um, this policy basically defines the role and scope of work for internal auditors, their authority, organization of the internal audit department. Um, note that the internal auditor will report administratively to the superintendent and report to the audit committee and the school board um, functionally. 
So that will be a direct report basically to the board and the audit committee. I'll discuss the audit committee coming up. Um, the policy also addressed standards for the internal auditor related to independence and objectivity, as well as outlines his reporting and monitoring by the internal audit department. Um, note that reporting from the internal audit department will be to the audit committee quarterly in a public meeting if the, that policy passes in the upcoming agenda item. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Do I have a motion? Ms. Lamy, do I have a second? Ms. Hanson? Any comments from the public? Any from the board? Mr. Bro? Thank you. Um, Mr. Javier, Ms. Ms. Prevost, could you uh, give us the background on what's causing these changes? I, I think it's a good story. We, we, we listened to the public. We, we met with other, other people that had interest on this topic. And, and all of these motions are to become more transparent and more open to the public's needs. So could you briefly give us uh, the background? You basically just did. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's been a, uh, a discussion for several years. Um, we've had members of the public, um, the Federation, board members. Um, Mr. Incapera and I have discussed it. Um, I've had draft policies written for a while. It just wasn't the timing, just didn't seem to ever work. But now it's the time to revamp the whole internal audit process to be more transparent and to be independent. So it's direct report to the board, not influenced by management in any way. I think it's a good good um, start. I completely agree with you. Thank you. I don't see any other comments queued up, so let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. Item C. D, sorry. Yes. All right. Um, this policy is also a new policy, and it's DIDB, and it would create an audit committee. Um, I provided you with the draft policy. Again, we never had, we have, haven't had an audit committee, so this is, um, it's the policy didn't exist. Um, the policy will provide for the creation of an independent audit committee. The policy outlines the responsibility and organization of the audit committee. Um, the primary purpose of an audit committee is to provide oversight of the financial reporting process, the audit process, both internal and external, the company's um, the school board system of internal controls and compliance with laws and regulations. So it's a totally independent process. Um, the committee will consist of eight voting members appointed by the school board. The eight members should be independent members of the community who through education or experience, possess the knowledge in accounting, auditing, financial reporting, and or school board finances needed to understand and evaluate the school board's financial statements, external audit, internal audit, and the school board's internal controls and activities. The members cannot be school board employees or be employed by the firm performing the external audit to keep it independent. The school board's legal counsel, superintendent, and myself, the CFO, will serve on the committee as a non-voting ex officio member. Audit committee members are volunteers and will not be paid. The audit committee will meet no fewer than four times during the fiscal year, subject to in accordance with Louisiana open meeting law. They can meet more at their discretion and probably will need to. Um, the audit committee will submit a report to the board each quarter or after every meeting det detailing the activities, and um, that will be on an agenda. So that we'll bring it to the board so the public can also participate in that. Um, this report will be presented at a monthly committee meeting, and the audit committee will be governed by a charter, which I'm bringing up in a, uh, an agenda item. Um, a draft charter has been created for the board approval. Um, it's agenda item F, and the audit committee, once established, is free to make changes to that charter. This is just to get it started. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Do I have a motion? Ms. Rutherford, second by Ms. Hanson. Uh, <clears throat> Any comments by the public? Mr. Broom. First member. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for signing up, Mr. Broom. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Robert Broom from Slidell. Uh, I think the administration and the board is to be commended for taking these steps. I know it has been a long time uh, in development. Uh, I'm encouraged. Uh, as many of you know, I've been involved in school board committees and 
commissions and all those things for decades. And this is a very impressive and far more consequential um, committee and group than I have previously seen this board choose to take. Um, again, you're to be congratulated for that. Um, it will be a serious effort. Uh, the members of the um, committee, whoever they are, are going to be taking on a, a task here. And it'll benefit the school system. It'll benefit the administration. And I think it'll benefit the public because we'll know a lot more and have a lot more understanding of the details. Uh, this is a huge system with a huge amount of money that goes through it. And the more transparency that we can bring to this and the more attention we can bring to this um, will be good for all of us. So again, I commend the administration for doing this and I hope the board supports it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Underwood. I apologize earlier. I got you confused with another Stephanie. Okay, Stephanie Underwood with the Federation. Um, I, I just wanted to say thank you. I really feel like, and I'm pretty sure that Ms. Previous might have told me this, I think this is the first of its kind in any kind of school board. So we like being awesome <laughs> and we like, you know, starting something. So I'm really excited to be a part of this time with you guys. And I just want to say thank you and y'all are doing great. Thank you. Any comments, further comments from the public? Mr. Osborne. I just uh, also want to express thanks to Ms. Prevost and Ms. Dan Caprera. So part of this came from an event that some of y'all attended. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of emotions and things, but some good came out of it. So um, I'm just very appreciative. Um, Ms. Prevost is very detail-oriented. And uh, like Stephanie said, this is unique. You know, um, and it... It's something that will help improve transparency, but also the, the public trust. And it's never had been saying somebody's doing something wrong. It's just about getting better. So thank both of them, or thank you to both of them. I'm appreciative of this. No further public comment. I'd like to open it up to the board. And Ms. Baker's first in the queue. So it is to force eight board members to try to come up with people with that kind of background and experience that is willing to just do it on a community service basis. And if we don't come up with eight people or consistently eight people, because this, this is asking our community members on a volunteer basis, um, and, and maybe they'll be retired and looking to, to for goodwill work, but this is a lot of goodwill work. So. I'm just making sure that this um, that we'll have the reports necessary, even in the event we don't get eight people. You can always adjust the policy. If we do eight was just let's go with this, let's go with eight and see how many we get. We can start the committee with less members. Okay. We can adjust the policy, um, and we can keep trying to get members. I put that in there in the in another formal agenda item. Um, but just to address this, um, I researched almost the whole state of Louisiana, I found entities, school boards, um, municipalities that did have audit committees, but I found no one that had an independent one. Um, they have them in the Florida school board, they're required to have independent audit committees. That's required by law there. So we're in line with that. So this is um, it's a unique, and I think it's, it's a good opportunity to be totally transparent and, and rebuild the public trust, which is our goal. Thank you for that. I think it's gonna be huge. I'm just concerned, you know, I just hope people sign up because yep. I think it's amazing and it's kudos to you and your staff. Thank you. Yep. That would be me. Sorry, Ms. Martin. And what's the term these volunteers will serve on this committee? Um, it's in the charter that's coming up, but um, I propose two years. Again, they can change it. This is just a draft to get them started. The, they can make changes once they're established and change the terms, change anything they want in the charters and bring it back to the board. Um, and who you know. do they report to? The when audit, they, when the they, audit committee is in, independent, but they basically report to you. So okay. what they'll do is they'll meet at least four times a year, quarterly. 
Um, they will oversight internal audit, external audit, and they can um, oversight controls and make recommendations. They will, once they meet, they will bring report. the next committee meeting, they will bring a report to the board at a meeting. Thank so, you. Right. No further comments from the board. Let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. Uh, item E. This is consideration of revisions to the internal auditor job description that goes hand in hand with these policies. Um, I provided you with the draft job description and an original job description with red line changes, but I'm going to turn this discussion over to Mr. Alfonso since it relates to human resources and let him address it. Thank you, Ms. Prevost. Uh, I'm going to highlight the the important changes to these job, this job description. And once approved, I just want to bring it to your attention that uh, Mr. Incaprera, our current internal auditor, will sign this job description also. Uh, major change, reporting for the position changed from total supervision by the superintendent to functionally reporting to the audit committee, audit committee and board. Okay, so that's changed. But administratively, this position still will report to the superintendent. So the functionality of it will report to the committee and the board, administratively report to the superintendent. The revised job duties are as followed. Internal audit function must adhere as close as possible to the standards of professional practice in internal auditing. Ms. Prevost is talking about all that. Basically, this job description is reflecting the policies that are being brought before you. And then we update the wording that the duties include audits of programs and departments, not just financial. So the processes of departments in which they conduct business, auditing of schools and finance departments. So it's going to switch from basically looking at financials to looking at programs and the processes. Align duties and expectations for the position with the standards of professional practice of internal auditing, which Ms. Prevost just spoke about and change monthly reporting to the board to quarterly reporting to the audit committee and all other reporting will now be presented to the audit committee, which she just spoke about what the audit committee is going to consist of. Lastly, allows to make recommendation all processes for the school district in particular to improve operations, efficiency, and cost effectiveness. So the shift is focusing from financial to processes. So that's the major revisions to the job description, I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Prevost if you have any questions, just in terms of the duties itself. Thank you. Okay. Do I have a motion first? Ms. Baker, second by Ms. Lamy. Any comments or questions from the public? See none. Any from the board? Ms. Rafino Gallo? So <clears throat> I think Ms. Baker asked if we don't get this committee up and running, can we even do this? Can we even approve this before we even have a committee going? Um, yes. Well, you approve all the policies, even anything the audit committee recommends. So as a policy or charter, you would ultimately approve it. Now, if you didn't get the committee going, we'd have to maintain um, uh, the presenting to the board until we got an audit committee going. But um, we have some interest, so I think we're going to be able to fill most of the positions. Maybe not eight, but um, we'll see. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to say something before moving forward. From an HR standpoint, when a job description is approved or we have a job description, the advertisement needs to reflect what the job, what is stated in the job descriptions. So once you approve this, this will then give us the opportunity to move forward advertising the position. Is <clears throat> this new hire? Is this a? Um, is this person equal with our existing internal auditor? Or there's no. What, what is that? Are we not there yet? Okay. That's I. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Jump the gun. So we're all comments from the board are done, so let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. Our next item. Okay, this is consideration of the audit committee charter. 
I provided you with the draft audit committee charter. Um, this draft charter will initially govern the audit committee. As I stated earlier, the audit committee can make changes and bring a new charter to the board once they are established. The charter discusses the following, um, the mission of the audit committee, which their main function would be to oversight external and internal audit of the school board, as well as monitor internal controls and compliance. Uh, the composition of the committee is discussed. Um, you're gonna have eight voting members, as, as I said, with three non-voting members, legal counsel, superintendent, CFO, volunteer position with no pay. They must be independent, not school board employees, or employed by the firm that performs the audit. Conflict of interests are discussed and how they would need to be disclosed by the audit committee members. The proposed terms of the audit committee members is two years from July to June, the school board's fiscal year. The charter discusses vacancies, replacement, and removal procedures. Administrative function of the committee will be to meet a minimum four times a year quarterly or as needs arrive and report to the school board the next committee as a whole meeting. Voting process is discussed in the charter in detail. Um, the committee will elect a chair and a vice chair annually who will run the audit committee public meetings. They will be, have to do a training with legal counsel to learn how to conduct meetings if they don't know how. Um, minutes and agendas will be required for these committee meetings, same as any other board meeting. Um, oversight of external audit services outline. The committee will be involved in external audit process in the selection of auditors, issuing RFPs for audit services, meeting with external auditors on draft annual reports and any management letters, meeting with external auditors prior to the audit engagement beginning, so they have a dialogue with them, an open dialogue. Um, and other external audit oversight is all outlined in the charter. Oversight of internal audit services and internal control is also outlined. The committee will monitor the fiscal health of the school board, including reviewing effectiveness of school board organization, operations, and personnel. Oversight of school board internal controls, including making recommendations to management. Um, provides the school board with oversight of the internal audit function. The committee may participate in the interviewing for potential internal auditor candidates and give input to the superintendent in that hiring process. The committee will meet quarterly with internal auditors or as necessary to review the work plan, risk assessment, and reports. And they will have open access to the internal auditor as well as you do. So you can contact them and discuss anything with them. Um, the committee will provide feedback to the school board related to internal audit and make recommendations as necessary. The committee may make inquiries of management related to financial risk or exposures, significant findings from auditors, and will review the adequacy of internal controls and other financial areas with management. Um, that is a brief overview of this charter. It's very detailed, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. And again, they can change it once they're, once if they want to add something or change anything and bring it to you for a vote. Thank you, Ms. Prevost. Do I have a motion? Ms. Baker, second by Ms. McCollum. Any questions or comments from the public? Any from the board? Ms. Rafino Galler? How does one be, um, say they want to be on this committee? How does one apply or whatever? It's um, agenda item H. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was just going to say, whoever recruits these eight members needs to uh, rec start recruiting teachers, yes. too, because yeah. they're obviously really yeah. good at, yeah. and bus drivers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other comments from the board. Um, let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. Our next item is item H. Okay, consideration of the internal audit charter. Um, I provided you with that document. Um, this draft charter will initially govern the internal audit department. The audit committee can make changes and bring a new charter to the board once established. The internal audit charter provides general guidelines under which the internal auditing function operates. Um, this document is required by internal auditing standards, so that's why um, we developed this draft. Uh, the Charter's primary pur purpose is to document internal audit's broad objectives, nature, professional status, and reporting responsibilities. It also defines the relationships with the Audit Committee, the School Board, the Superintendent, and Management. Um, the function of internal audit is defined as to provide the Board, Audit Committee, and Management with independent analysis, appraisals, and recommendations concerning the adequacy and effectiveness of internal control and management performance. The charter outlines required internal controls and compliance with laws and regulations that the school board must maintain. 
The charter also defines the reporting relationship as outlined in the internal audit policy, administratively reporting to the superintendent and functionally reporting to the audit committee and or board. The relationships are defined so that the internal audit function is independent of management and will conduct reviews independently and objective, objectively with no influence from management. Um, the responsibility of the audit committee, the superintendent, the internal audit department, and principals department and program supervisors are clearly defined in this charter. Internal audit standards are defined for independence and objectivity. The charter requires that the internal audit department will adhere to standards regarding internal audit as set by the Institute of Internal Auditors, including its statements of responsibilities and code of ethics, standards for the professional practice of internal auditing, and statements on auditing standards issued by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Professional proficiency and due professional care are also defined. Definitions for internal controls and scope of internal auditing work are provided, as well as def definitions of all the different types of audit that, audits that could be performed by the internal audit department. The audit plan is defined as well as access to records, management responsibilities and representations, and audit reporting process, including audit work papers and the retention of those. So that's a brief overview of this charter, and I'll be happy to take questions. Do I have a motion? Mr. Bro, do I have a second? Ms. Yeah. Lamy, sorry. Uh, any questions or comments from the public? Any from the board? I see none. Let's please vote. <laughs> and that motion carries unanimously. Uh, item H. Okay, this is consideration of approval to advertise and seek applications for the audit committee members. Um, I provided you with a summary description for applying for the audit committee and a writable PDF application. If the board approves tonight and next Thursday, the application and summary will be posted on our website for the public. They can go access it and, and fill out the application and submit it. Um, the board members will also be sent a package to send out to potential candidates that they may think are interested. Um, I will, we will send those out on the 10th to you, so you'll have the package. Um, they can also, potential candidates can always contact me and I will get it to them if they don't want to go onto the website. Um, a resume will be required to be attached to the application. That's the only attachment we're requiring. We are also proposing that applications be accepted from February 10th to February 28th, assuming we have approval, or until the eight positions are filled. So it could continue um, I would say cut off on February 28th with what we have, approve those, and then continue to advertise until eight positions are met and approved by the board. If enough applications are received, an agenda item will be added at the March committee meeting so the board can vote on applicants. Board members will be provided with all applications and documentation received in advance of the meeting for their consideration. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Do I have a motion? Ms. Hansen? Do I have a second? Ms. Rafino Galler? Any questions from the public? Yes, Ms. Underwood. Um, so I know the, bo the board members are recruiting uh, people, but then they're also having to apply. So can people that are just interested apply, or do they, if, since the board has to vote on it anyway, or do they specifically have to be seeked out from the board members? Can I address this? Please, yeah. Ms. Prevost? Yes. Yeah, they can contact anyone that can go. It's, it's anybody that's interested, and then the board will decide who serves on the committee. So um, the applications are wide open. You just have to have the, you're going to have to have some qualifications as far as auditing and accounting, um, financial reporting to understand the process. So they need to have in their experience some, some of those items. Any other questions from the public? I'll turn it over to the board. I see Ms. Martin queued up. Thanks. Um, it says here that the candidates have can have no relationship to the school board that may interfere with um, what they're doing. What does that mean? Does that mean um, if we know someone that maybe we're, and this isn't the case, I'm just wondering if we're related to or if we, what does that mean? We would have to look at each one, but you wouldn't want to have somebody independent. So you wouldn't want to have a spouse of an employee 
because um, they could be influenced by management. I'm not saying that would happen, but that's the, the point. You want to be independent. So it kind of would fall in the same line as the code of ethics, ethics. is it, the way we, we would follow. I would say, suggest that we follow that, okay. you know. And they can't be work for the external audit firm, obviously, since they would be judging that. Ms. Prevost, I see that you'll be collecting applications. Mm -hmm. Are you are you going to be filtering those, uh, or yeah. are we going to see all of those? You'll see them all. I'm just going to forward it. I just okay. put it there for convenience. If y'all want to change that, we can. Make Christy, um, I'm fine with yes. <laughs> <laughs> you. Sure, Christy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I will just forward them on. Um, I just want to help you maintain your independence in all this. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, if, so if there's if another way, maybe to. they go through the board president or. Yeah. Uh, I think you would be great. Really? <laughs> I am good yeah. at hitting a forward button. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're welcome to change that. I mean, less work for me. Um, but I, I didn't plan on filtering at all, just forwarding them. So, but if someone wants to be the contact, or we can create a web, we can we create, maybe get Lewis to set up a link so they go there because we do have email addresses where they can go that's independent and then someone can go and get the applications. I, I'll maybe them. suggest just doing that just okay. so you know you yeah. wash your hands of it and mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about it. Okay. I'll check the email okay I'll check whatever database Mr. Bouillon sets up for us. So okay. we'll update that for next week okay. and we'll get it we'll get an email address going. Great thank you. Yes Ms. Hanson. If there is somebody that has questions, who should they be related to? Who should they be directed Probably to? Probably me. Okay. I can just give just them the detail sure. information and, yeah. and provide them with any of the, the draft documents. Because I don't um, think well, I they'll be, be approved once them. we do this. So, yeah. <laughs> no. I don't see anybody else queued up, so let's please vote. And another unanimous vote. And the last item, item I. Um, this is consideration for approval to advertise for one additional internal auditor and to add to the budget. Um, so that process would begin um, advertising in journals and things like that. We get better results um, to um, get an additional internal auditor. Um, I provided you with an estimated cost of hiring another internal auditor, assuming that auditor had 20 years of experience, which is a lot. But um, that with cost of, with benefits, education, we have to keep maintain their education level for their um, certifications and travel costs using their car for business um, would be approximately $123,700. Um, this would give us two internal auditors. We'll work as a team um, on the internal, fo um, internal audit function report to the audit committee. Do I have a motion? Ms. Moore? Second by Ms. Baker. Any comments from the public? Any from the board? I'll just go back to my question that I had posed earlier. Are, th are these, from a salary benefits perspective, equal yeah, with our current? The, yeah, internal we only order? have the one job description, so that would be that be equal. Okay. If you, if we, at some point when we, if we had added internal auditors, we would probably need to, hire, you know, create a new job description for someone to oversee. So this person is is really going to need to work with Mr. Incapraer hand yes. in hand to decide yep. where where they're going to audit, what they're going to do. Yes, they'll have to develop an audit plan. That's all in the charter, and okay. they'll work together on that as a department, and they'll decide who's going to do what. I mean, they'll still probably want to do some school audits, but then they can look at processes mm -hmm. in the different departments. Great. Okay. Um, Something else I didn't mention that I think is a good idea um, to um, create a page on the website where employees can anonymously report fraud to the audit committee and to the internal auditors, um, maybe a dedicated line or something. We can come up with something. I think that will make us even more transparent so they can feel comfortable going directly to them and filling out a, app, you know, a, a complaint form. And then they can investigate it if so they choose. And Ms. Lamey's going to man that line. <laughs> yes. That's right. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so we and, have a motion on. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And, and, and board members, just remember that it takes a process to go through this, uh, and it'll involve the audit committee. Yeah. And the plan would be to have this person in place for July one, right, Terry? Yeah. July one would, would be the yeah, by then, would be the sure. would, yeah. to have this person in place for that time. Because yeah. the audit part, committee really should have input, so we need to get them formed. Right. Exactly. And we, get we, them it's going to take a process then, yeah. to get the audit done. Yeah. To get qualified people, you really need to advertise in journals and on sites because. 
people don't go look at our website. So right. it's just it's an easier process for the, uh, this professional position. Ms. Hurstis. Um, well, first, I just want to say I think this is flipping awesome. I'm very, very excited about this. Um, but secondly, um, I mean, we do have, obviously, I'm, I'm assuming we have the money in the budget for this, that yes. it's not coming out of anything else. And Yes, yes, ma'am. All right, so we don't have to sell, like, Girl Scout cookies or no. something to pay for this, right? No, okay. We can, we can shift some funding around. I think it's it's a benefit. Um, Caddo Parish has multiple internal auditors, and they audit processes, and they found, you know, all kinds of things that's actually paid for the internal audit department. Wow. Okay, that that's fabulous. That cracks that people didn't know was occurring. Thank yep. you. Yeah. Okay. No further uh, board comment. Let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Prevost. And you're up again for the... Yes, I'm getting hold. Um, item A. Okay, um, this is recommendation for approval of fiscal year 22-23 federal, state, and local budgets. The federal and state budgets had to be approved by the, um, the Louisiana Department of Education um, before we could bring them. Um, they, with, this, with the grants, they're not ready when we do the original budget. Um, the state decides how much money we get, and then they also decide how we can spend it. So once we get that all ironed out, then we bring them to you per policy. Um, if there's any changes to these budget, we will bring you a final look how the grants ended um, in the fall. Um, but I'll be glad to answer any questions. Also, someone had asked, I, we did put at the top um, a description of what the grants are, just a brief description. And the supervisors are here if you have any particular questions about spending. Do I have a motion? Ms. Lamey, do I have a second? Ms. Moore, thank you. Um, any comments from the from the public? Mr. Broom. Thank you again. My name is Robert Broom from Slidell, and uh, I'm always fascinated by, especially these. Federal budgets, they're an important part of our financing, and they cover a large range of educational opportunities. Uh, the first question I've got um, is on page 15, the Early Childhood Communications Network Federal Grant. Uh, I'd like to get an explanation of that, just what it means. Um, before we get an answer, though, I do have one suggestion. Um, the ESSER funding that we have here, if I added it up correctly, um, just did it this evening, it's over $80 million. And there's a strict timeline on spending that. And I would encourage the administration to make regular progress reports about how that money is going. Um, as we all know, as, as the deadline approaches, um, things happen. So it needs to be tracked through the entire spending cycle. And I would encourage the administration to make uh, periodic reports on how that's going. Uh, we're going to get all the money spent well um, before the deadline. So the question is, the question I asked was the, um, the communications network, if that could, if I could get an answer on that. Yes, the early, that's a, we, that's we, oh, go ahead. sorry, we sorry. receive funds for our network, which is, we are the LEA, which is the lead agency over all the early childhood centers. So we receive funds. It just passes through us. We don't get any of the funds. So that Early Childhood Network grant is our community network with the early child care centers, with the um, Head Start network that we get, and we fund them materials, um, curriculum. We pay for uh, if they have, like, rent that they need help with. Okay. So it, we're just a pass-through. We do not get any of those funds. And as far as ESSER goes, the money will be spent. It's already been budgeted. And we're going to do a, um update on ESSER at the March meeting. Yes. And on the ESSER, um, we do do the um, 
which at the same time as the budget, the public hearing, we always do that on the ESSER funds as long as they remain. And as far as the deadlines, as long as the money's obligated in, in most of our long-term projects or capital projects, they're going to give you extra time. That's already came out as a ruling, so um, that's going to happen. As long as we've obligated, got a contract, because people are having trouble with, you know, supply and demand due to COVID, so they're going to they're going to let that be extended. So no worries there. Good. Always always concerned about money though. Um, if I may ask one more question, um, there's something in here called the Achieve Homeless ARP. I just like to know what that means. Christy Sapalou is here. She can answer what that is. I guess I could have answered since you said all. <laughs> um, that's just a, a, a part of the, the COVID relief fund that we receive to support our homeless students. We use it the same way that we use our Title I for our homeless students in the same way that we use our McKinney-Vento. Just anything that they need, they all have individual needs, so we just use it to support anything that we can help them during that time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Broom. Any other comments from the public? And I see Ms. Rafino Gallagher queued up. On the... First thing that uh, Mr. Broom talked about, which I'm trying to find the page it was on, but I can't. You mentioned something about we help them with their rent. Who is they? The child care centers. We have 44 child care centers in this district that's considered type three child care centers. And what the state has provided us funds for us to help them with certain allocations. It could be rent, it can be um, um, payroll, or it can be anything to help their building, so or build the support the child care center materials, curriculum, staffing. So there is a assurance form that they have to find that the state has outlined. This is what the funds can be spent on. If they meet the assurances, they turn in receipts to us, and we pay them for that. And rent is one of them due to COVID. That's a COVID relief budget. And when I say rent, I don't mean for their house. I mean rent for the no, child no. care center. I, I understand, but that, then oh, I guess okay. that's my... No, no, no. I, oh. I, I get that. That's why I was trying to clarify that, too. Yeah. But So we're... this I'm money saying rent because some of them have rent, some of them have mortgages. So it depends. Right. So, but these are not... These are for students that are not in our public school system. They're at child care centers. That is correct. That's in okay. our network. What do you Again, mean? This when is you, just a funnel. network... Our early childhood network, that's what it's called. Okay. So the 44 centers, the Head Starts and the Early Head Starts make up the network. Okay. We don't set the rules for the spending on this. The state decides that, and they just make us do the work. So. Right. right. <laughs> okay. Ms. Rutherford? Is the Little Red Schoolhouse one of our early childhood centers? That is. Okay. Yep. Today, this morning, yes. Ms. Bro, I mean, Ms. Um, Moore, Ms. Martin, Matt Green and I went to it and we toured it today. This is Early Childhood Month, Awareness Month, February. Um, we were very impressed with what we saw. And um, I'm glad that some of this money is going to help our students who are going to be future students in St. Henry Parish, which will empower us later on, hopefully, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Ms. Prevos, I just have one question. When I was looking through most of these pages, mm -hmm. uh, most of the expense items were salary and benefits, right. a lot of those. Right. Those are all, you know, reoccurring sticky expenses. What happens when the ESSER funds run out and are we on the hook or what's going, what are we going to do uh, well, with all these Well, we're not on the hook, but we, we can move them into general fund um, if we so choose. Um, but like the nurses, for instance, they're being funded, part of them, the new ones, they will have to move into general fund. So we, I'm, I have that on my radar that I'll need to be incorporated once the funds are gone. So do you have any idea of, you know, like a percentage of that? Because again, um, I'm just curious because my, my worry is that you know, we strain the budget bringing on one-time right. expenses with... Right. Well, we're just going to have really to remember because nurses are too important, so we need to have that. And that was always known that they would be added, so that's always factored in. Um, some of the other positions, I'm, I'm not sure what they are, but, we, you know, I'm, I'm, they're temporary, but we can 
we have the funds. We'll just have to determine it at that time. Okay. We've got a ways to go, so. So we're not on the hook, per not se. Yet. We can make that decision when the time comes. Exactly. Okay, yeah. thank you. We'll find the money to keep. Ms. Ms. Hurstis. Um, when we were talking about the, I guess it's early, early child care, you know, like before, you know, are, are these, are they like obligated to our own guidelines? I mean, are there certain guidelines that, so they have to follow everything that, that we want? Not we, the state. So well, the in state. order to be part of our network, only type three centers are part of our network in order. So there are way more than 44 child care centers in St. Tammany. But to become part of the network, there are strict guidelines that they have to okay. follow. All of their teachers receive class observations. They have to um, uh, pro they have to provide services to children who receive CCAP. So that's the funding if you are in need to help support pay for your tuition. So there's very strict guidelines that they have to follow mm -hmm. by the state and maintain a certain status. So if the teachers in their class are getting observed and they're ineffective, they can lose their type three status. So okay. you have to meet a certain criteria to receive these funds. And the students that go there, or the children that go there, mm -hmm. are they um, mixed, meaning like some pay and then some don't? That's correct. So okay. if they're on CCAP, which is Child Care Assistance Program, then the state's paying for them to go there. Or a But anybody can else can pay. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the school we went to today had a good mix of both. That's okay. All right. Uh, no other comments. Let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. Item B. All right. This is consideration of revisions to school board policy DJE, which is our purchasing policy. Some um, are changes related um, to changes in the law. Um, I'm going to ask Ms. Uh, Tiffany Carrasco to come up. She's the supervisor of purchasing, and she's going to go over these um, policy changes, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions afterward. But I do, these next few policies, um, one of the reasons we're proposing these is for cost efficiency. The paperwork we're requiring for schools and for all our employees um, for s small dollar amounts um, is costing us money. So um, um, we're we're proposing to raise some limits, so she's going to go over that and let you decide and vote on it. Thank you. Good evening. There's three purchasing policies that we're going to address today. Each of these issues are either a result of changes in statutes or to put into policy what is already into practice on our daily things. So for DJE purchasing, on page one under grant uh, contracts administration, that section, we want to formally adopt what we're already doing, which is the board president and the president and the superintendent must sign contracts obligating the district, but that the superintendent or his designee can sign routine and necessary contracts. If at any point you have any questions, just stop me because I'm going to kind of run through them because there's a lot of them. On page seven, there's preferences. Currently, we have a preference for local businesses. Under $10,000 purchases, if you're a local business with a storefront, we allow a 5% preference, meaning if you're 5% higher than another bidder, then you can get the, the job. We're asking to increase that to $30,000 to align with some other thresholds in the next policy that we're going to discuss and with the law. There's a new preference that the state adopted, which is in reference to veteran-owned companies. And there's strict guidelines on what these veteran-owned companies have to do to qualify, and it's, it's governed by the economic district of the state. So after meeting and discussing with the board president, he had suggested that the law allows a 12% preference, but it, out of that meeting came a, an 8% preference. So we're recommending that for purchases under 30000 which is the current small purchasing guidelines that we give an 8% preference to veteran-owned companies who qualify under the state law. And that's all that I have. Oh, one other one. The uh, Also, to limit one preference per purchase. So you couldn't claim that you're a local vendor and also a veteran and get a 13% preference. You can do one or the other if you qualify for both. Yep. So that's all for DJE 
item B. Do I have a motion on DJE? Ms. Moore, do I have a second? Ms. Baker, any questions from the public? I see none. Any questions from the board? Mr. Bro. Uh, I do support the policy, but because I have seven children or spouses of my children that are veterans, I will have to abstain from voting. As, uh, Ms. Rufino, oh, Ms. Rufino Galler, sorry. I will probably abstain from that as well, only because I'm in the military, but I have a question. It's, uh, you're saying small business or veteran owned, but I don't see where it says small business on here. All I see is veteran, veteran owned small entrepreneur. So it, it's a veteran owned small business. Okay. Cause it's you, not but, a either are. Did I but, say it? Well, no, well, cause you said they could either claim a small business or a veteran and not get the 13%, but it just says a veteran owned small. So that's kind of one. So but there's two different differ ones. I don't mean it. So it's veteran owned small business would get an 8% preference and then local businesses. So you have, you have a storefront in okay. St. Tammany Parish. We currently already have that policy in place where you would Got get 5%. It. And just to clarify, this um, veteran owned, they have to go through a process with the state. It's just not all veteran owned companies. You've got to be read, you know, do an extensive process with the state and get approved as a veteran owned company, just like you do with women owned companies. There's a, there's a certification they give. So, so there is a, a database that purchasing would have to check if someone claimed the veteran owned and we would check that for each purchase that would apply to. Thank you. I don't see anybody else queued up. So let's please vote. And that motion carries 12 yeas and two abstentions. Item C. Item C is in regards to DJED, which is bids, requests for proposals, and quotations. There's some legal language or verbiage that our, in our council has asked that we put in there. And then also this is going to address the threshold changes that are with the law. So on page one, we're adding clarification about routine maintenance being exempt from public works. It's straight out of the definition of public works in the legislative policy. But for clarity, when people are understanding, we just added a little sentence for that. On page two, the Louisiana legislator, legislation this past year upgraded and changed the thresholds. So we're going to ask that we do the same. So bullet one, our current policy requires three quotes for any purchases over $1,000. The law last year was 10,000, this year changed to 30,000. So we still wanna stay more restrictive than the law, but we would like to increase that to 5,000. It gets very burdensome on teachers and administrators trying to get three quotes for things that are $1,000. So we request that that go to 5,000. So bullet number two, is in relation to maintenance, the maintenance department and work that they do. Excuse me while I get that one policy up. So we're asking that for maintenance and repair projects that are less than $30,000 that we do not require quotes. As you know, with lumber and things like that, it's, it's getting to be pretty hard to get those quotes. And bullet number four would be purchases between 30,000 and 60,000 would require three documented quotes on the quote form. A little farther down, for purchases of $60,000 or more would require bids. That is equal to what the law is. The law changed from 30 to 60. And that's it for DJED. Do I have a motion on DJED? Dr. Peterson makes that motion. Ms. Moore has a second. Any public comment? Yes, sir, Mr. Osborne. So I've uh, been touring some of the schools and some of our CTE folks, whether it's a, you know, a carpentry teacher, welding, uh, they say it's often difficult uh, to get lumber and uh, materials that they need. 
Does this apply to them? I'm just asking that rhetorically, and maybe somebody can answer. Because yeah. if it does, I think you're going to have some happy folks. Yeah, it just raises that from 1,000 to 5,000 now. So, any other questions from the public about the board? Ms. Hirstus. Yeah. So, um, I mean, as far as like this isn't part of like the whole like construction with bids and stuff like that. Construction is generally under, it's the same title that we're, we work under, but Public right. Works has a $252,000 bid threshold. So okay. their stuff will remain the same. When they do small smaller projects, they do follow the same guidelines that everybody else does. Right. So it would help them as well. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to ask a question, and I'm not sure. I, I was reading over them, but I don't remember, like, what letter it mm -hmm. was. Um, but I just want to make sure, like, when we get different bids, mm -hmm. that we don't just always pick the lowest one. By Are we law, on that yet? By, by law, we have to. But what if they're, like... Well, I mean, I get it, but I mean, you could just, I mean, I understand that they have to have, you know, certain criteria, mm -hmm. but I mean, what if they do a shoddy job and they just happen to be the lowest bid? So there's a process if we've done business with someone and that we've had issues, there's a process to document it and then exclude them from being able to do business again, but it's, it's, a, it's a process to go through. So if you just did business with somebody, we didn't document it, we didn't go through any kind of recourse then if they're the lowest bidder by law we have to we have and to write no very detailed specifications on the requirements that they have to meet but again specifications guidelines are set by law as well so we have to very carefully follow those and we don't just get to pick you know those that we're familiar with those that we know do good work we can't well i mean we can't see like any of their prior work because i mean i'm just i'm not going to name any housing people but, you know, say there's a housing company that develops houses and they're really shoddy, but they happen to be the lowest bid, you know, and we just have to pick them. But if they're the lowest bid and they meet all the qualifications by law, we have to choose that. Vendor. Yeah, we don't really get a say in that, unfortunately. Okay, well, who, who makes a say in that? The, the state, state legislature. Okay, is there something that we can do to go to state for that? Sure. You can. We can. They just have to vote on it. <laughs> yeah, a field trip for the board or something. I mean, Miss Martin's bus. <laughs> yeah. Look, she's not even here. She just got volunteered. <laughs> okay, because I mean that's just silly. I'm a statement made. I'm not sure the history of that. It, I think it came out under the Jindal administration, but it, uh, that is that is. Well, the I mean, big I don't law care and, who and, who who did it. Or I just care that it's silly. Tiffany, correct me if I'm wrong. We don't have this problem very often, though, right? Not that I'm aware no. of. No. Okay. So it doesn't well, that's, come up that's good, yeah. but, you know, yeah. it may. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Rufino Gallo? I just want to clarify the maintenance re repair projects that are less than 30 don't require a quote. Don't require three quotes. And actually, oh, the okay, it just says quote. Okay, so when it said quotes, I'm like, so they don't have to give us a quote. For well, anything? yeah, we would like, get one. It just one. doesn't say three. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> yeah. So they could just bill us twenty nine nine ninety nine for anything, okay. and we're not going to ask for anything. That was my question. Yeah, we okay. would get a quote. Gotcha. Yeah, and just to clarify, I mean, this doesn't prevent schools from going and getting quotes. You always want to get your best price. These are public funds. Mm -hmm. We're just not going to require it. But if we see some unreasonable stuff happening, we're gonna we're gonna yes. come back to you with something. So um, everybody needs to remember, you need to be reasonable and still try to get your best prize. And we, we look in the purchasing department to make sure things aren't being split to stay under a threshold. We're very cognizant of, of that, that that could happen. And it would be hard for it to slip through. Okay, with no other comments from the board, let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. We don't govern PTAs. They're a separate organization. Item D. Item D is DJEF for professional services. I want to clarify that public bid law, which is what the school board is governed by, does not require RFPs and competitive solicitations for 
these services. However, as a district, we've chose to, to do that to make sure we get competitive um, contracts. So currently, it is required for services over 30,000, and we would like to adjust that to 60,000 to match the other thresholds that, that we have put in into place. Additionally, to add municipal and financial advisors to the list of exemptions, and to clarify the intent of what small construction projects means to include maintenance workers performing certain construction projects. And that's all. Okay, Ms. Baker jumped all over that one with a motion. <laughs> Do I have a second? Ms. Rutherford, do I have any comments from the public? Any from the board? Seeing none, let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. Item E. I do not have that one in front of me, but DJ authorized is authorized signatures. Mm -hmm. it, it, I don't have it to read it to you, but it is pretty much taking what we did in DJE about contracts administration and placing it over into DJA about the who can actually sign those things. It's just mirroring the law, so we just cleaned up the wording a bit. It's stuff we're already doing. But. Do I have a motion? Mr. Bro. You'll be signing all these. <laughs> Do I have a second, Ms. McCollum? Any comments from the public? Any from the board? Let's please vote. And that motion carries unanimously. Uh, item F is our monthly financial statements. Okay, for I November, provided. December. I'm sorry. I provided you with the monthly financial statements for both November and December since we didn't have a January committee meeting, and I'll be happy to answer any questions on those two reports. Any questions on these reports? I had one. Any, any reason why the ad valorem taxes are way down for December? Because we don't start collecting, and the, with their new process, most of our money is going to come January, February, March. They had a little delay because they got some new software, but okay. we didn't get much money in December. Okay. I just noted a, a big drop from last year. So yeah, it did, um, and there was reason. They prepared us, so we knew, but, okay. um, but yeah, it'll kick in. Um, Great. Well, we should, we, for January it did. So. Uh, the monthly purchasing report. Ms. Carrasco is here to answer any questions on that report. Any questions for Ms. Carrasco? Not tonight. Thank you. Do you have a question, Mr. Brown? Actually, we uh, we don't actually allow public comments, but on on this particular purchasing report. But if you want to come to me afterward, we'll make sure we get it addressed. Okay. Thank you. Sure, Miss Baker. Um, I just wanted to take a moment, maybe ask us all to stand in a moment of silence in honor of Miss Gail Sloan who passed away on January 14th. She was our um, super, do you know Mr. Javia what her time was here? I know she was the superintendent when I was employed. If you wanna I do not, say. I, I wanna say it was right at 10 years. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I just think that just out of respect for her contribution to our, um, to our schools that we just stand and honor her in silence for a second. If y'all don't mind. Thank you. I would like to say, Ms. Baker, real quick, uh, I have been contacted by some retired uh, personnel that want to do something for Ms. Sloan in, in the future, and I'll bring that to the board when it's appropriate. Okay. For the record, she paddled me in fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Next item on the agenda is public comments, and uh, Ms. Osborne is first. <clears throat> Good evening again, board members. Uh, I think Mr. Broom would agree this tonight was momentous. 
and to be such a, a newly formed board, and you may not realize this, you took some amazing strides to really distinguish this board and to move our district forward. forward. So I thank you for that. Um, just have some brief uh, prepared uh, remarks here. Um, teacher and school employee working conditions are student learning conditions. Challenging working conditions are contributing to attrition and the retention of employees. Every employee we lose deepens the shortage crisis. So with that in mind, the Federation is rolling out a, a campaign called Work Shouldn't Hurt. This campaign is designed to improve working and learning conditions for all. And there are four pillars of focus, school violence, workplace culture, well-being, both physical and mental, and environmental safety. Uh, so this, you know, we don't pretend to have all the solutions. So what we do is try to gather data in a variety of ways and to share that data with you. And if our, if our members and uh, potential members share ideas and pro help problem solve, great. We'll share those ideas as well. Um, but I think it's going to take all of us working uh, together to meet these challenges. Um, we'll also do some personal and professional development for our uh, employees. Um, we're going to try to build networks and strengthen partnerships to address the pressing issues that we all face. And this campaign is not about um, finger pointing. It's about working together uh, to solve these problems that I know can be solved. It's just going to take some work. And uh, I look forward to working with the board and also administration. And I thank you all again for a momentous evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Ms. Sharp. Barbara Sharp, bus driver. Bus drivers are charged with the safety of the busload of children, sometimes as many as 70 elementary children. When distracting and inappropriate behavior happens on a bus, the safety of the whole bus is jeopardized. It is the driver's responsibility to do document and report these incidents, but it is the responsibility of transportation and school administration to take the appropriate steps to ensure the safety of that bus. Failure to follow through with timely and appropriate actions jeopardizes the whole bus. It is imperative that appropriate and timely action is taken when a bus driver encounters and sufficiently reports and documents inappropriate student behavior of any type. This applies also to all educational environments. Student violence and disruptions and inappropriate behavior to other students and staff is unacceptable. Administration continues to spend millions on purchasing buses, tracking programs, and equipment to track children, but appropriate intervention on repeated and disturbing student behavior on buses and in schools would have zero cost, but would be effective in establishing a zero tolerance for these incidents. Knowledge of routes, routes rather, and the students and their parents is essential part of what a driver needs to maintain control of a moving vehicle loaded with students. There is not any consistency in what is happening on a large percentage of the bus routes now. Drivers out, no subs, students shuffled from one bus to another multiple times a week or maybe even every day. Confusion with what driver is picking up in what area, it is like who's on first, but really we are experiencing what, what buses each child is on every day. We need some attention paid to the transportation of children. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. Uh, we'll take a brief recess, and uh, without any further business, this committee meeting is adjourned. No, no, no. No, no, no.